This is a reading of The Guardian of the Threshold, the third mystery drama by Rudolf Steiner. This is a reading of the person, spiritual figures and happenings, and also the synopsis of this. The occurrences of a spiritual and soul character, which are sketched in the successive scenes of The Guardian of the Threshold, represent a continuation of those shown in my previously published Portal of Initiation and Soul's Probation. Together they form a whole. In The Guardian of the Threshold the following characters and entities appear. Number one, the bearers of the spiritual element. A. Benedictus, leader of the Sun Temple and teacher of a number of people who appear in The Guardian of the Threshold. The Temple of the Sun is named only in the Portal of Initiation and the Soul's Probation. B. Hilary Gottgetroy, the Grand Master of a Mystic Brotherhood. He was shown in an earlier incarnation in the Soul's Probation as the Grand Master of a Spirit Brotherhood. C. Johannes Tomasius, Pupil of Benedictus. Number 2. The Bearers of the Element of Consecration, Devotion, Sacrifice. A. Magnus Bellicosus, called German in the Portal of Initiation, the Preceptor of the Mystic Brotherhood. B. Albert Torquatus, called Theodosius in the Portal of Initiation, Master of Ceremonies of the Mystic Brotherhood. 6. Professor Capacius. <coughs> Number 3. The Bearers of the Element of Will. A. Frederick Troutman, called Romanus in the Portal of Initiation, Master of Ceremonies of the Mystic Brotherhood, reincarnation of the Second Master of Ceremonies of the Spirit Brotherhood in the Soul's Probation. B. Theodora, a seeress. In her the will element is metamorphosed into naive seership. C. Dr. Strader. 4. The Bearers of the Element of Soul. A. Maria, Pupil of Benedictus. B. Felix Balder, C. Felicia Balder. Entities from the spiritual world, Lucifer, Araman. Entities of the human spiritual element, the double of, the of Tomasius, the soul of Theodora, the guardian of the threshold. Philea, Astrid, Luna, the spiritual entities who further the uniting of this human soul with the cosmos. The other Philea, the spiritual entity who hinders the uniting of the soul powers with the cosmos. The voice of conscience. <coughs> These spiritual entities are not meant allegorically or symbolically, but as realities, which for spiritual perception are the equivalent of physical persons. 1. Ferdinand Reinecke, Fox. 2. Michael Edelmann, Nobleman. 3. Bernard Redlich, Upright. 4. Francesca de Mut, Humble. 5. Maria Treufels, Loyal. 6. Louis Fürchtegat, God-fearing. 7. Friedrich Geist, Inspirited. 8. Caspar Sturmer, Firebrand. 9. George Warmund, Truthful. 10. Marie Kühne, Bold. 11. Herm Hermine Hauser, Provincial. 12. Katharina Ratsam, Prudent. These are reincarnations of the twelve peasant men and women of the soul's probation. Editors note the names of the twelve. Although they are not used on stage, give a hint as to their character. Therefore an English translation has been added. The events of the Guardian of the Threshold take place about thirteen years after those of the Portal of Initiation. The manner of repeating earth lives, as encountered in the Guardian of the Threshold, must not be taken as a universally valid law, but rather as something that can happen at a special turning point of time. What happens, for example, in the eighth scene between Strader and the Twelve People is only possible at such a point of time. The spiritual entities that appear in the Guardian of the Threshold are never thought of allegorically or symbolically. He who knows a spiritual world as something real may well represent the beings who are as valid for him there as are physical human beings in the sense world in the same way as he shows the latter. 
Whoever holds these beings to be allegories or symbols misunderstands the whole way of presenting the happenings in the guardian of the threshold. The spiritual entities do not have human countenances, as they must have in the stage presentation, is of course obvious. If the author of these scenes depicting soul happenings held these entities to be allegories, he would not represent them in the way he does. The arranging of the characters in groups three times four was not striven for, nor does it underlie the presentation. It arises sub subsequently for one's thinking out of the events which were conceived quite for themselves and which of their own accord shape such a grouping. <clears throat> to have had them as a basis is something that would never have occurred to the author. To present them here as a result is permissible. Synopsis Scene 1. A group of twelve persons, representing the general public, has been invited by a mystic or occult brotherhood. What up to now has been cultivated behind closed doors, traditional mystery wisdom, seeks a contact for the first time with the outside world. The brotherhood is motivated to this step by the publication of certain books on spiritual science, which reveal basic truths in modern thought form. The author is Tomasius, whom the Brotherhood wants to honor because of his clearly demonstrated attachment to a spirituality which has its roots in the Rosicrucianism of the Brotherhood itself. They offer to sponsor his work. Scene 2. Tomasius refuses this offer. In reality, what he has written will be utilized by Ahriman, because Tomasius himself is not able to exert full control over his lower self. His own unbalanced nature will influence the destiny of his writings. He describes an actual encounter with Ahriman on his way to this meeting. There is a sketch by Rudolf Steiner among the preparatory notes to the Guardian of the Threshold, which contains a speech by Ahriman directed to Tomasius at their encounter. Although discarded in the final script, it throws light on the words of Tomasius in Scene 2. Ahriman, these wheels of fire I roll and roll endlessly up the precipice in the everlasting course of human life. I feel within me how human souls exult in joy when I lift mountainward the fiery element. In me re-echoes the triumphant loud rejoicing of human spirits who, advancing, feel themselves led from step to step. And yet, however often I've believed the start and finish of the work complete, it always came to nothing more than the beginning of a new toil. <clears throat> Uncertainty thus tortures me, whether the goal will ever be in reach. And only one thing do I know for sure. My aim will be achieved when this titanic work, my undertaking, ignites within one single human soul a little spark which can flare up to steady flame. Although gigantic is my work, it needs this one small spark to reach its final goal. Till now there have been several souls resolved, but fear soon quenched their spark of life, fear of those worlds which hold me fettered fast. Scene 3 Maria unexpectedly meets Capacius in Lucifer's realm. Both are outside their physical bodies, surrounded by the alluring picture world of Luciferic astrality. Capacius's soul is a captive of this world, reveling in it to such a degree that he does not welcome Maria's attempt to arouse in him an awareness of his ego's duties within the physical body. But her words will have their effect when Capacius comes to a new awakening in the etheric world, in scene 6. Maria's soul had entered Lucifer's realm for the sake of Tomasius. She witnesses the initiative which Lucifer has taken in order to bind Tomasius to himself. He uses Tomasius's double to inflame a passion for Theodora. It is an illusionary but magical effort of intervention. To this, Maria, with the encouragement of Benedictus, reacts with words that carry in themselves through their selfless energy the final defeat of Lucifer. Scene 4. A quiet, harmonious conversation takes place between Strader and Theodora on the occasion of their seventh wedding anniversary. The scene ends, however, on a note of doubt and shock. Lucifer's machinations have begun their work. Scene 5. After Theodora's unexpected death, Strader takes comfort at the home of Felicia and Felix Balder. 
Capacius is also a visitor, but in a disturbed state of mind. After the retrospect into his former life in medieval times, he has lost interest in the present time and place. His mind is absent, dwelling in realms removed from his normal consciousness. From time to time it breaks through and brings messages from these other worlds to his friends. In this scene it is Theodora's soul actually appearing for a moment with which he is in direct communication to the bewilderment but also for the benefit of Strata. The following three scenes take place in the supersensible worlds. Scene 6. Capacius' soul finds itself carried into the etheric world by mantric words received in earlier times from Benedictus and now sounding to him. Benedictus himself intones them, leading Capacius to a situation where his own soul forces reveal these mantric words as thought beings outside himself. In a dramatic confrontation, Lucifer and Araman re-echo the mantric words in sound and movement. Finally, the fairy tale of the child of light, imagination, gives Capacius the inner strength and courage to bring back his ego consciousness into his earthly body. Scene 7. Tomasius, accompanied by Maria, appears before the guardian of the threshold. He has the vision of a life in pre-Christian times and, still under the spell of Lucifer, interprets it as relating to Theodora. Because Maria vouches for him, the guardian lets them both pass through into the spiritual world, which reveals itself at first as the icy fields under Araman's rule, the realm of death as shown in the next scene. Scene 8. Araman, in his own domain, is not recognized by Hilary, although his companion, Troutman Romanus, has a frightening reaction to the cold darkness surrounding them. Strader enters, fully aware of Araman, and is a witness to his power over the twelve souls who in their sleep come under his spell. He recognizes in Araman the ruler over those forces which on earth are at work in the laws of measure and number. The scene ends with Tomasius's initial experience beyond the actual threshold, a renewed encounter with his double, and his release from Lucifer's magic spell. Scene 9 After the highly dramatic events of the preceding scenes, the conversations that follow, in a pleasant landscape, breathe harmonious tranquility. At an earlier morning hour, Benedictus meets his friends, Capacius and Strader, who have become his pupils. Tomasius recalls to Maria his shattering experience in Araman's realm. She confirms the vital step he has made by crossing the threshold. What is so striking in this scene <clears throat> is the fact that these conversations take place while the various groups are walking in the country, not far from a large city whose outlines are visible on the horizon. Rudolf Steiner has described a similar scene at the time when the mystery center of Ephesus was flourishing. Priests and neophytes conversed while walking along paths branching out from the temple. Scene 10 The sanctuary of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood is a symbolic temple with three altars. Only Benedictus's presence establishes the link to the supersensible Sun Temple, which concluded the first and second plays. The duties at the altars in east, south, and west are now taken over by free individuals, who under the guidance of Benedictus have achieved direct insight into the world beyond the threshold. Felix and Felicia Bald join them, although their paths were somewhat different, leading from mysticism in one and imaginative knowledge in the other, to the same recognition of the demands of this modern age. In this scene, Maria and Benedictus speak out the name of Christ three times, first in the Paulinian sense of not I but Christ in me, secondly as with us now, and thirdly as the dissolver of karmic blood ties. The soul forces close the play with words of grace, in which the audience as well can feel included. Luna, I will implore from primal powers courage and strength and let them help self-sacrifice to grow, so that what is perceived as temporal can be transformed to seeds of spirit for all eternity. The end of the synopsis. Scene 1 A hall in the prevailing tone of indigo blue. 
the antechamber to the rooms in which a mystic brotherhood carries on its work. Twelve persons are present, conversing, each of whom in one way or another takes an interest in the endeavors of the brotherhood. Besides these twelve, Felix Balda and Dr. Strader. The events of this scene and those following it take place about thirteen years after the time of the portal of initiation. Ferdinand Reinecke It is a most extraordinary summons that brings us all together here and now. It comes from people who have always thought that they were given special spirit tasks and kept themselves aloof from other mortals. But now it must be that the cosmic plan has clearly shown their spiritual eyes that they must link themselves with other men who fight their way through life by their own efforts, without all blessing from the spirit temple. I never was attracted by their style. They always have recourse to secrecy, whereas I want to stay with healthy thinking and lay great weight on simple common sense. The mystic brotherhood that summons us surely does not intend to raise us now to knowledge of its highest aims and plans. It will address us in mysterious words, but keep us in the temple's outer court, saying that we express the people's will, but using us to further its own plans. Thus we are made into the tools and servants of all those people who look down on us and think they're born to rule us from on high. They would not think us yet mature enough to take a single step that would entail our getting near their spiritual light or glimpsing any of the temple's treasures. When I reflect on their true attitude, I find it naught but pride and trickery, fair-spoken though it is, and humbly dressed. It would be best that we avoid, I think, the so-called wisdom offered to us here. But still, we must not let it seem as though we blindly set ourselves against the work that now is praised so much by everyone. Therefore, I say, let us politely listen to what these lords of wisdom have to say, and then be guided by our common sense. One who thus lets discretion be his tutor will never fall a prey to the temptations that come upon us from the mystic's temple. Michael Edelman I cannot tell. I cannot even guess what treasures of the Spirit have been given to those who now would find a bridge to us. But I know many really noble men belonging to this spiritual league. Though strictly silent, touching all the lore that must have been imparted to their souls, they clearly show through deeds and way of life the source that feeds them can be only good. For everything proceeding from their ranks displays the earmarks of the purest love. Therefore I think whatever moves them now is also good, as in the present project they seek to join themselves with men like us who know the striving of the soul for truth but have no knowledge of the mystic ways. Bernard Redlich The thing for us to follow here is caution. The mystics seem to think a time is near that spells the end of their old sovereignty. No reasonable person nowadays asks what the temples say about the truth. If any propositions made to us seem sensible to ordinary thinking, it may behoove us to collaborate. But they must lay aside the mystic robes if they would like to step across the bounds which long have kept them closed off from the world, as if they lived within the realms of light. Their high opinion of their merits will carry little weight among us here. They must not be awarded higher status than they deserve by normal human rules. Francesca de Mut. A large amount of what you are saying here makes me suspect that you are like those men who are completely blind to all the light that long has flowed from out the sanctuaries in streams of noble wisdom through the world to heal and comfort all the souls of men. Only a man who lets his heart be brightened and lets his soul be filled with warmth and zeal can recognize the meaning of this hour. The mystic realm is now to be revealed to those who always felt themselves too weak to stand the sanctuary's ancient tests of fitness to receive the Spirit's light. Maria Troifels Many sure signs there are that clearly show how many changes must take place in souls accepting leadership 
in their life's course. But far less certain that the mystic path can lead us surely to those blessed goals that stimulate the forces of men's souls. I sadly fear that leaders now are lacking, who in their harnessing of nature's forces combine both genius and agility, and thus, while working at their earthly tasks, show practical ability in action. If such men plant the roots of spirit work in the good soil of plain reality, they will be able, soberly, to work in this world for the good of all. Being convinced entirely of this view, I see in Strader, rather than the mystics, the forces needed for the leadership of men. How long we have experienced with pain that all our technical accomplishments have only added to the heavy fetters that hindered our free striving toward the spirit. But now we can begin to have a hope, a hope of which till lately none could dream. In Strader's workshop, one can find already amazing things still in the model stage, which, if they work, may change technology in such a way that it will never more oppress our souls with dreary, hopeless weight. Strader, your words are optimistic, but my work seems headed in the right direction. It still must cross the gap that separates experiment from application, but up to now the expert eye inclines to find it technically feasible. I hope that the inventor of the thing may be allowed to give his own opinion of what he has accomplished at this stage. And since my words to some may seem immodest, I ask indulgence for them in advance. My aim is only to describe the feelings which from the forces for my work have sprung. It happens often in the course of life that all our labor soon becomes detached from feeling and from soul, becoming soulless, the more our spirit learns to dominate the forces found here in the realm of sense. Our labor in producing needed goods grows more mechanical from day to day, and with the labor also life itself. For years much careful thought has been devoted to finding measures, finding ways and means to rescue labor from technology, so that the soul would not be lamed by work, but workers feel connected with the spirit. Yet little was achieved by all these efforts, because one question only was considered, the right relationship of man to man. I, too, devoted many weary hours for grope, to groping for the answer to this riddle. <clears throat> I always found that my deep cogitations produced in actual life no real value. I very nearly reached the harsh conclusion that in this world our destiny ordains that our great triumphs in material realms can only prejudice the spirit's growth. Then there occurred a seeming accident, producing a solution from the muddle. I had to institute experiments, which seemed at first remote from all these problems, but suddenly the thoughts sprang forth that showed me the right way. Through one experiment upon another I finally discovered at my desk a way by which to harmonize the forces, so that when all the details are worked out, through pure technique, there will result that freedom in which the soul can properly unfold. No longer must our laborers be forced to spend their days in soul-degrading sweatshops, dreaming their lives away like vegetables. The products of technology will now be so distributed that every man will have what he may need for his own work within a house arranged to suit himself. I beg to speak first of this hope to you, so as to furnish some foundation for what I have to say about the summons the Rosicrucian Brotherhood has sent to persons standing outside their own ranks. If in the future we can find ourselves and let our souls develop properly, then only health will follow from those instincts by which one spirit seeks another one. So now it's fair to say that honest thinking is bound to recognize the correspondence between that summons and the signs we see. The spirit brothers want henceforth to offer their lofty treasures freely to all men, because all men should now demand them. Felix Balder The words that we have just heard spoken here have fought their painful way out of a soul that's able to bestow upon our times true values in the, sen in the realm of sense perception. In this particular field today, I think, no one can be compared with Dr. Strader. 
I have myself, by wholly different ways, discovered what is needed by the soul, and hence may be permitted a few words. I was by destiny assigned to the task of seeking out the treasures that a man can find within the precincts of his soul, and there I seemed to find the kind of wisdom that can illuminate all values here. I was allowed to study mysticism in contemplation and in solitude, and on this path it was not hard to learn how all that leads us men to mastery of forces working in the realm of sense imposes on us too a sort of blindfold, so that we grope to find our way in darkness. And all the treasures gained on earth by science through application of the mind and senses are still a fumbling in obscurity. I am convinced that only mystic paths can lead us to the genuine light of life. I stood myself upon these paths of truth as one who worked with no help from outside, but this is not within the power of all. Sense, knowledge, intellectual thought to me seem like a body without soul, as long as they so stubbornly resist the light that since the first days of the world has flowed out from the mystic sanctuaries. Hence we should grasp in love and eagerness the overtures made to us by the temple, upon whose threshold roses bright and red bedeck the somber symbol of man's death. Louis Fürchtegat A man aware of his own soul's true worth is able to rely on his own judgment when he begins to seek out for himself the spirit and the spiritual worlds. But one is lost who only in blind faith surrenders to the leadership of others. Even the light that one would like to find within himself as force of higher wisdom deserves no serious acknowledgment unless its truth is clearly proved. The light can be a danger to a man if he inclines to it without such proof. For all too often on this path the soul accepts as valid knowledge of the world what only springs from its unconscious wish. Frederick Geist <clears throat> Every modern man should feel impelled to understand the workings of the mystics. It seems to me that if one thinks he knows just what the goal is like before he starts, illusion will result instead of truth. But of the mystic it is said that he relates himself to his high goal of truth as men do who desire to see the beauty of distant views from a high mountain peak. They do not paint the picture in advance. They wait until they've climbed up to the top and actually see what they have sought. Ferdinand Reinecke At this time let us not concern ourselves about the proper attitude toward truth. The brothers of the League will surely not be eager for opinions from us. But recently reports have reached my ears that an event of very special import has forced the brothers to consider us. Tomasius, who for many years already is active in a spiritual stream that is devoted to occult pursuits, has learned to use the thoughts and words of science, in which our times have perfect confidence, to clothe the presentation of the wisdom that was, till now, initiation lore. He has succeeded, through his brilliant work, in bringing many circles to applaud writings that have a logical appearance but actually contain rank mysticism. Scholars who must be taken seriously have said enthusiastic things about him and thus have added to his growing fame, which now seems dangerous in certain eyes. The initiates now fear that one effect will be to undermine the old belief that they have sole possession of this lore. Therefore they want to take into their fold all that Tomasius has brought to light. Their aim is to make everyone believe that they have become that they have been aware for many years that this material would be revealed, and this was merely part of their great plan. If they should now succeed in craftily enlisting us as members of their circle, then they will spread the word throughout the world that both Tomasius and his message were sent out by mighty lords of destiny, so that the common race of men might come to believe in their importance to the world. Kaspar Sturmer The mystic school continues as before to claim the privilege of guiding man. This shows how little real respect it feels for all that healthy people have achieved 
in the long struggle to uplift mankind that started with the proof that soul and nature could be explained by mechanistic laws. It's painful to a liberated mind that such a clever man as Dr. Strader should show himself inclined to mysticism. One with his understanding of the forces should certainly be able to see how modern psychology itself requires that mysticism be eliminated. The spurious science that Tomasius now boldly promulgates to all the world should show him how the best intelligence degenerates into mere fantasy when it succumbs to this delusion. For had Tomasius only trained himself to think in strict accordance with dame nature, instead of playing with this mystic trash, his talents certainly would have allowed him to produce fine scientific work. But on the other path that he has chosen, he could not possibly escape great errors. The Spirit League, however, may believe that errors can be very useful to it. It profits from the general impression that science now has clearly documented what really is such stuff as dreams are made of. George Varmunt The fact that anyone can speak such words as those that we have just been made to hear shows us how pitifully undeveloped in our dark days the understanding is that stems from cultivation of the spirit. We only need to think of early times and recollect what lived within men's souls when science, which is now so dominant, was not yet present even in the bud. When we do this, we see the Mystic League is executing at this time a deed that long was written in the cosmic plan. The great work had to be anticipated that's now succeeding for Tomasius. The way is new by which he's trying now to bring the Spirit's light to human souls. But this same light, you may be sure, was working in all that's been achieved by men on earth. And if you ask where this light had its source, the signs all clearly point to mysticism, as it was nurtured in the sanctuaries in times when man could not be led by reason. <clears throat> the brotherhood that now has summoned us wants to allow the mystic light to stream upon the work that boldly tries to wring real spirit knowledge out of human thinking. And we who stand upon this hallowed ground in this brief moment fraught with destiny, we are the first who uninitiated shall be allowed to see the godly spark leap from the spirit's heights to human souls. Maria Kuna Tomasius needs not the sponsorship the Rosicrucians contemplate for him, since in a serious scientific way he shows the soul's path through repeated lives and how it lives in spirit realms between. His deed has made available to all, even those, even to those who shun the sanctuaries, the light to which the mystics used to lead. Tomasius deserves the recognition that's been so richly granted him of late because he gives our thinking just that freedom that was denied it by the mystic schools. Hermine Hauser I think the Rosicrucians have no future, though they will surely be remembered long. What they call forth at just this point in time will undermine the temple's whole foundation when it becomes aware of its own power. They have courageously resolved to bind reason and science to the sanctuaries. Therefore Tomasius, whom they receive so willingly into the temple now, will look to aftertimes like its destroyer. Strader, I have been blamed for saying candidly that we should now express our readiness to work together with the Mystic League in furthering Tomasius's work. One speaker said my views were painful to him because I ought to know how dangerous the mystics are to real psychology. But mysticism often seemed to me most understandable just at the time when I was most absorbed with all my heart in mechanisms I myself had made. The way I was related to my works showed me the nature of the sanctuaries. And while I was at work, I often thought, what can I be to one who only tries to understand just how the forces work that I have implanted into the machine? And then, again, what can I be to one to whom I lovingly reveal my soul? And it is owing to such thoughts as these that the ideas stemming from the mystics could open to me all their deeper meaning, and thus I know without initiation 
that in the sanctuaries souls of gods reveal their essence lovingly to men. Katarina Ratsan The noble words that we have heard just now from Dr. Strater on the sanctuaries must be applauded by the many souls who never could themselves approach the portal through which initiates could freely pass, but still had made themselves acquainted well with all that these initiates could teach. That our ancestors tended to believe the mystics hostile to the light is understandable. Their souls were sealed against all hints of what the temples hold, concealed mysteriously within their walls. This is no longer so. The mystics keep their light but partly veiled. They tell the world all that the non-initiates ought to know, and many souls who have received this light and have enlivened it within themselves experienced this as an awakening of forces in the soul that formerly shrouded in sleep worked all unconsciously. Three knocks are heard. Felix Balder The masters of this place are coming now, and you will be allowed to hear their words. But only those among you who are free from prejudice will understand the words and feel them working inwardly as light. The power of the initiates will work vigorously on open minds and hearts, if these have been prepared to sacrifice illusions when the truth at last shines out. But they will have no influence at all where error has been hardened into will and thus the sense for truth has been destroyed. <clears throat> Ferdinand Reinecke A man who seeks through lengthy introspection to reckon, recognize himself within himself may find the time to dwell on words like these. But in our dealings with the mystic league, it would be better to recall the stories preserved in records or in old traditions about how secret brotherhoods behave. These stories show that many able men have let themselves be lured into the temples when they are told in veiled, mysterious words that in these walls they could expect their souls, starting from wisdom of a lower grade, to move ahead to more advanced degrees and in the end attain to spirit sight. Those who succumbed to such temptation were in the lower grades shown signs and symbols upon whose meaning they were told to brood. They hoped, of course, that in the higher grades the meaning of the signs would be revealed, along with other wisdom. But they found, when they were brought into the last degrees, that, lo, the masters also knew but little about the signs, and that their revelations were empty phrases signifying nothing. And then these men, if not bewitched by words or overwhelmed by idle vanity, would turn away from all such trickery. At this time, I suggest, it would be prudent to think of these historical reports and not be swayed by edifying words. Again, three knocks are heard. The Grand Master of the Secret Brotherhood, Hilary, enters, followed by Magnus Bellicosus, the Second Preceptor, Albert Torquatus, the First Master of Ceremonies, and Frederick Troutman, the Second Master of Ceremonies. The persons assembled grouped themselves on each side of the hall. Frederick Troutman, the Second Master of Ceremonies. <clears throat> this moment is significant for you and us, dear friends, because at last we are united before our ancient Holy Temple's doors. We sent our summons for the meeting here because this was required by all the signs that our revered Grand Master could perceive in the great plan laid out to guide the earth. In this plan it is clearly indicated that now the time has come to bring together the sacred wisdom of the sanctuary and ordinary human common sense, which seeks the truth far from the mystic paths. But those same signs also revealed to him that all this could not be accomplished till a man should come who could express the knowledge that has its base in reason and the senses in forms that would enable normal men really to comprehend the spirit world. This has occurred. Tomasius succeeded in giving modern science a report containing proofs for all the spiritual things that up to now could be discovered only on mystic paths and in the sanctuaries. His book must be regarded as the bond uniting you and us in spiritual life. 
You will be able, through this book, to learn how solid is the base of all our doctrines, and this will make you willing to accept from us the further knowledge that till now could be acquired through mysticism only. So we may hope a new life will arise, blending the general sense of all mankind with ancient customs of the mysteries. Magnus Bellicosus, the second preceptor. My brother's words have made it clear to you that we were moved by very earnest signs in sending you the summons to meet here. Our master will soon add a few brief words, giving a deeper explanation of it. My task is now to speak, so far as needed, of that extraordinary man whose work has brought us all together in this place. Tomasius had devoted all his life to painting, till he felt himself impelled to scientific thinking through some inner call. Within the realm of art he could unfold the glorious gifts with which he was endowed upon, only upon his entering those circles that were devoted to true mysticism. There he was made acquainted with the Master, who could display to him the early steps of spirit sight, according to true wisdom, and then in spirit heights, experiencing himself among creative powers and beings, he painted pictures that could work like magic. This would have driven any other artist to keep himself within his chosen field, while seeking ever higher peaks to climb. To him, however, it was but a spur to use his talents in the way that seemed most apt to benefit mankind at large. He came to see that spiritual science can have a firm foundation only if the sense for rigorous scientific thinking is freed by art from its intense desire for rigid forms and is enlivened so that it can feel the world in all its glory. And so Tomasius has sacrificed his artist's work, which could have been his joy, to benefit his fellow men on earth. If you, my friends, acknowledge this man's merits, you'll understand the meaning of our summons and hesitate no longer to respond. Hilary the Grand Master. In that Spirit's name who has revealed himself to many souls within this holy place, we now appear before these persons, who till now were not allowed to hear the words that here resound mysteriously. The powers who guide our progress on the earth could not, in the remotest days of yore, reveal themselves in light to everyone. For it was as with children, Gradually the forces had to be matured and strengthened that were designed to carry on our knowing. So was it that mankind in general had slowly to unfold in course of time. In darkness lived at first those impulses that later came to show themselves as worthy to see the spirit light from higher worlds. In those remotest days when earth began, great spirits were sent down from higher worlds to be the wise and watchful guides of men. They cultivated in the sanctuaries the, those spirit forces that could penetrate mysteriously into the souls who had no conscious knowledge of their leaders. And later the wise masters found that they could choose from out the ranks of men disciples who through renunciations and fierce tests had proved mature enough to be initiated into the sacred wisdom of the mysteries. And when the pupils of the early masters learned to protect the treasures worthily, those mighty teachers took their way again back to their own far distant habitations. The pupils in their turn selected men who could succeed them in the watchful care of spirit treasures. So it went on further through generations numberless to us. And to this day all genuine mystic schools descend directly from that earliest one, which was established by the higher spirits. Humbly we cultivate within these walls what has been left us by our ancestors. Never will we assert that our own merits deserve the offices that we now fill. The lofty spirit powers choose by grace the feeble men they need as messengers, and to them they entrust the precious treasures that can unbind the spirit's light in souls. And it is to these treasures, my dear friends, that we must give you access at this time. Auspicious are the signs that we can see with spirit sight in the world's destiny. Ferdinand Reinecke How far afield you go to find the reasons that should persuade us to join hands with you in vigorously promoting the great work Tomasius has given to the world. 
All that you say sounds very beautiful, but in our simple minds it is outweighed by the conviction that if it contains exactly what is needed by men's souls, the book can make its own way in the world. In our opinion it has won acclaim by reason of the science it contains, and not because it's full of mysticism. If this is so, how can it help the book to have the hearty praise of all the mystics rather than winning minds by its own virtues? Albert Torquatus, the first master of ceremonies. <clears throat> the spirit science that Tomasius has so convincingly presented there will neither gain nor lose by any praise that we or you may publish to the world. The point is that through it the way is found by which men turn their minds to mysticism. It will accomplish only half its task if looked at as a goal and not a path. And now it's up to you to understand that finally the moment has arrived for reason to combine with mysticism, giving to modern spiritual life a force that can effect real impact only if loosed at just the proper time and place. Curtain, end of scene one. Scene two of The Guardian of the Threshold by Rudolf Steiner. The same hall as in scene one, the persons who were at first assembled there have left, with the exception of Felix Balder and Dr. Strader. Present are Hilary the Grand Master, Magnus Bellicosis, the second preceptor, Albert Torquatus, the first master of ceremonies, Friedrich Trautmann, the second master of ceremonies, Maria Johannes Tomasius. Hilary My son, you have accomplished now what must receive the seal of sacred and primeval knowledge, besides the blessing of the cross of roses adorning here our consecrated place. What you have given to the world shall be, through us, a spirit offering, that it bear fruit in all domains of life where powers of men can be of service for the progress of the world. Magnus Bellicosis To give the world your work, you were obliged to separate yourself for many years from much that once had been most dear to you. The spirit teacher standing at your side left you, in order that your soul could then unfold its power fully. Your cherished friend and close companion left you, too, for you should find what men may find if they can follow the forces of the soul in their own self. With courage you have overcome these trials. For your own good you were deprived of all that, for your good is now restored to you. You see your friend before you. In the temple she'll welcome you, complying with our wish. You soon will also greet your teacher. United with us at our temple's threshold, these friends receive you as the one who brings to modern man the knowledge of the Spirit. Felix Balda to Tomasius The mystic way of life, which strove till now in inner contemplation toward the Spirit light, will through your act be opened up to knowledge gained within the world of sense. Strader, you've also found for souls who search for spirit knowledge, though life fetters them to matter, the paths which lead each one in his way to the light. Tomasius, exalted master, and you, gentlemen, you think you see a man before you whose earnest striving and whose strength of spirit was able to produce a work entitled to your praise and kind protection. You think that he will certainly succeed in reconciling science, as esteemed today, with ancient sacred occultism. Indeed, if faith in my accomplishment could be conferred on me by any other means than my own inner voice, it only could be by such words as yours. Friedrich Trautmann Our Master's words no doubt express what you feel in yourself, and so your inner voice, therefore, has not to be confirmed. Tomasius, Oh, were it so, most humbly would I stand imploring you to grant me here the temple's blessing on my work. I thought it would be so when first I heard that you would give protection to my work and let me pass the gate which otherwise is opened to initiates alone. 
but on my way to you a world unlocked itself to me, which surely at this time you had not meant to lead me into. Araman, in his full grandeur, stood before me, and I could recognize in him the expert in laws that govern our world order. What human beings think they know of him is worthless. Only he who has beheld his being in the spirit understands him. From him alone have I been able fully to learn the truth about this work of mine. He showed me how impressions of it, formed by men who judge in terms of science and of logic, are valueless, engaging its effects upon world evolution. Only then would their opinion count if the creation, disjoined from its creator, was set free from him, for then it might pursue its own course in the sphere of spiritual life. However, since this work must always remain bound up with me, it well could happen that from the spirit realm I might transform what I have done into its opposite, though its own nature in itself is good and could bring good results. From spirit realms I'll have continually to influence all that results on earth from my activity in sense existence. If I let evil pour from spirit regions and into these results, the truth will be more damaging by far than would be error, for men must follow truth impelled by their own insight. Error leaves them cold. I shall most certainly in future turn to evil the consequences of my work, for Araman has shown me clearly that these results must be his property. While I was busy at this work, intent and full of joy because it led me safely from stage to stage within the edifice of truth, I only paid attention to that part of me that concentrated on my research, while all the rest I left unguarded. Wild urges could develop, unrestrained, which hitherto lay dormant in my soul. And now in silence strength matured to fruit. I thought myself in highest spirit regions and was in darkest night of soul. Quite clearly, Araman, within his kingdom, could show me all the power of these stages. So now I know what later my effect will be, for these wild urges must in future become a part of my own personality. I had, and before I started with my work, already pledged myself to Lucifer, whose realm I wished to learn to understand. But only now I know what lost completely in my creative work I did not realize, that Lucifer, with most enticing pictures, surrounded all my thinking, while at the same time he created wild urges in my soul, which still are quiet, but surely will in future gain control of me. Troutman. How can a man who's reached such spirit heights and knows all this for certain still believe that he will not escape such evil? You can behold what is so harmful to you, therefore you must destroy it and with courage save yourself and the results of your great work. A spirit pupil has the iron duty to kill what hinders progress in himself. Tomasius, I see you do not judge by cosmic laws. What you demand is something I could do at present and could tell myself right now all this that you are telling me. But though my karma could permit this at the moment, it will not tolerate it later on. For things must come which will obscure my spirit and direct me just as I described. I shall, then in world evolution, greedily seize everything destructive in my work and shall endeavor to embody it within the spiritual life. I then, in having to love Araman, must joyfully hand over to his ownership whatever came from me in earthly life. A pause, while Tomasius ponders deeply. If this concerned myself alone, I'd bear it silently within my soul, and would await completely tranquil what destiny holds waiting on my path. But it concerns your brotherhood as well as me. The bad results that follow from my work for me and other human beings will all be balanced by the laws of karma. That you, however, fall, fell so deeply into error is far more serious for our life on earth. As leaders of this life, who should read rightly in spirit worlds, you never should have failed to realize this work had better be achieved by someone else and not by me. You should have known it must be put aside for now, 
and only later be produced afresh by one who could direct its consequences in a different way. Your judgment has deprived the brotherhood of rights it ought to have if it would rightly guide the sacred rituals. Because this follows for you from my vision, I come here to your threshold with this knowledge which would have otherwise kept me away. Now, truly, on this work of mine, whose end effects will be both good and damaging, I cannot take your blessing. Hilary, dear brothers, what we have begun cannot be carried further. We must withdraw now to the place at which the Spirit lets us know its will. All except Maria and Tomasius leave. The hall grows dark. After a pause, the three spirit figures, Philea, Astrid, and Luna, appear in a cloud of light. By grouping themselves, they hide at first Maria from sight. The following is a spirit experience of Tomasius. Philea The soul is athirst to drink of the light that flows from those worlds which an all-watchful will keeps veiled for mankind. The spirit is seeking, all eager to listen, to converse of gods, which benevolent wisdom conceals from the heart. But dangers can threaten those thoughts that are searching in regions of soul where far from the senses the hidden holds sway. Astrid The souls are expanding that follow the light and penetrate worlds which vision with courage reveals to mankind. The spirit is striving, enraptured, to live in regions of gods, which radiant wisdom proclaims to the seers. The hidden is beckoning to daring that longs for cosmic domains, which, far from men's thinking, Life's mysteries hide. Luna, the soul gains matureness to form itself insight, engendering forces which kindle in man a will that is fearless. From primeval sources the powers of redemption gain magical strength, concealed to the senses by barriers of earth. And traces are followed by souls that are trying to search out those portals which gods have shut fast to willing that errs. Voice of Conscience Invisible Your thoughts are wavering at being's abyss, and what upheld them in firm support is lost now to you, and what shone on them as sun is now obscured to you. You go astray in cosmic depths, which men, lured on by longing, desire to conquer. You shudder at the spirit growth, spirit ground of growth, where of soul consolation men must be deprived. The last words are immediately followed by those of Maria, who, concealed by the spirit figures, is still invisible. At first she speaks with a spirit-like but inward voice. Maria. So, Turn your soul again toward powers of love, which once could permeate your hope with warmth of life, which once could shine into your will with spirit light. Deliver from loneliness your heart's far-searching power, and feel the nearness of your friend in striving's darkest hour. The spirit figures disappear, with them the cloud of light. Maria becomes visible in her former place, Maria and Tomasius facing each other. The experience changes to the physical plane. Tomasius, out of deep pondering. Where was I now? The forces of my soul showed me the chaos of my inner life. The conscience of the world disclosed to me what I had lost. And then, as blessing, sounded the voice of love within the realm of darkness. Maria, Johannes, the companion of your soul, may once again stand at your side, and she may follow you to cosmic depths in which souls fight their way to a true feeling of gods through all destroying victories that boldly from destruction wrench new life. And I must lead my friend into the empty, unmelting fields of ice where now bursts free from bonds the light 
that must be formed by spirits when the force of life is lamed by darkness. My friend, you now confront that threshold of your life where one must lose what once has been acquired. You have gazed often toward the realm of spirit and have gained strength from it, enabling you to work creatively. It seems to you now that work is lost. Do not demand that this be otherwise, for such desire would rob you of all strength to journey further into spirit realms. Whether you walk this path in truth or error, you can keep ever clear the view ahead so that your soul is able to pursue its way. For this you must with courage bear necessity stemming from the nature of the spirit realm. This is the law of the discipleship of spirit. As long as you still nurture the desire that what has happened might be otherwise, you will lack the strength with which you must sustain yourself in spirit regions. That you have lost what you have already gained let this provide for you the knowledge for further journeys on the Spirit's rightful path. Henceforth you can rely no longer upon that insight which before you used in judging your own actions, if now with certainty you look on it as lost. Therefore your being must become completely silent and wait in silence for the Spirit's grace. You only can take counsel with yourself again when you have gained yourself anew. The solemn guardian you have often met, who keeps an unrelenting watch upon the threshold that severs spirit life from worlds of sense, but you have never penetrated past him. At sight of him each time you turned away and from the outside looked at everything. Since you have never been within that inner world which widens out as spirit actuality beyond you, so be ready now for what reveals itself when, at my side, you can not only enter, but also pass beyond the threshold. Curtain, end of scene two. This is scene three of The Guardian of the Threshold. Lucifer's Kingdom, a space not enclosed by artificial walls, but by plant and animal-like shapes and other forms of fantasy. At the left, the throne of Lucifer, At first the souls of Capacius and Maria are present. Somewhat later Lucifer appears, and then Benedictus, Tomasius with his etheric counterpart, the double. Finally, Theodora. Maria You, known to me in sense existence as Capacius, how is it that you are the being I encounter first in Lucifer's domain? There's danger in breathing in the spirit of this place. Capacius Oh, do not speak to me about Capacius, who, in the realm of earth existence, has battled through a life he long has recognized as dream. While there he turned his mind toward things that happen in the stream of time, and so he thought he could discover those powers which bring about the spiritual life and its effect upon mankind. His soul strove to hold fast his knowledge of these powers. From this domain one can perceive the knowledge that he cultivated. He thought the pictures that he had were true and able to reveal to him reality. But viewed from here, they clearly are but airy dreams the spirits weave into weak men on earth who are too feeble to endure reality. Benumbed and frightened would they be, if they should learn how spirits guide the course of life according to their plans. Maria, you speak as I have only heard those speak who never had a life upon the earth. They claim the earth is not significant, that its effects within the universe are small. But he who has belonged to realms of earth and owes to it his better powers must have indeed a different opinion. He finds significant the many threads of destiny that bind earth life with cosmic life. And Lucifer himself, who works with power here, looks toward the earth. He seeks to guide men's deeds in such a way that they bear fruits of service to his spirit. He knows that he would fall a prey to darkness if on the earth he could not find his victims. And so his fate is bound up too with earth. 
It is the same for other cosmic beings. And when the human soul can see in picture form the cosmic aims that Lucifer aspires to, and can compare them with the purposes of all those other of all those powers who have him as their enemy, the soul will know it can defeat, defeat him by victories in conquering itself. Capacius, the man who here is speaking with you dreads those times that force him to put on a body still alive that keeps its earthly form, although the spirit can no longer master it. At just such times this spirit feels the worlds he treasures are collapsing. It seems to him as if a narrow dungeon, bounded by nothingness, enclosed him cruelly. The memory of all that is pure life to him seems then extinguished for this spirit, and often too he senses human beings, but cannot understand what they are saying. Words only that are special can be grasped, that lift themselves out of the general talk and bring remembrance of the beauty he is allowed to see in spirit realms. He is in his body then, but and he is not. He lives in it a life which he must fear when he beholds it from this region, and he is thirsting for the time to come when from the body he will be set free. Maria the body which belongs to earthly souls bears in itself the means to recreate the divinely beautiful in noble pictures. And though these pictures only live in shadows in human souls, they are the seeds which later must flower and bear fruit in world evolving. So, through his body, man can serve the gods. And the true meaning of his life of soul can only show itself to him when, in his body, the strength of the essential I confirms itself. Capacius, oh, do not speak that word so near the being which has appeared to you in spirit realms and which is living as Capacius on earth. It wants to flee whenever that word sounds, a word which here can burn it fiercely. Maria, do you so hate what raises man to his true being? How can you live then in this realm, if you can find this world so frightful? For, for no one reaches this domain at all who has not faced this word's essential nature. Capacius, the one you see before you, often stood in front of Lucifer, who rules this realm. And Lucifer revealed to him that human souls who consciously use forces out of their earthly bodies bring only harm to this domain in which he, his will holds sway. But other souls, who in unconsciousness live on within their bodies, yet possess already powers of seership, these only learn in Lucifer's domain and cannot cause it harm. Maria, I know that in these realms of spirit one does not learn by words, one learns by sight. What in these moments I have here perceived, because you have appeared to me, will prove itself within my soul as progress in my discipleship of spirit. Capacius, one gathers here not only teachings, but duties also are revealed. You have conversed with that soul being that calls itself Capacius in the body. The spirit insight you have gained into a former life shows that you owe Capacius much through your own karma. Therefore you should beg Lucifer that he, the great light-bearer, let you give protection to Capacius on earth. Through your own wisdom you will know what you can do for him so that he may be led to you in later earthly lives, and so through you the debt may then be cancelled. Maria, must I allow this duty, which to me is sacred, to be fulfilled through power of Lucifer? Capacius, this duty you must surely wish to do, and this can only be with help of Lucifer. But look, he comes himself, the spirit of the light. Exit Capacius. Lucifer appears, and during his first speech, Benedictus. Lucifer. Maria, 
At my throne you are requesting self-knowledge for the human soul, to whom you are attached in earthly life. He shall, by the beholding of my being, first learn to know himself in his reality. He will arrive at this without your aid. How can you think that I would grant to you what you wish to accomplish for your friend? You follow Benedictus as your guide, who is my strong opponent on the earth, devoting all his forces to my foes. He has been able to tear much away from me. Johannes has renounced his leadership, and now has given himself instead to me. Not yet can he behold my real being, because he lacks full power of seership. He will attain it later on through me, and then be mine completely. But I command you not to speak a word which might in any way refer to him, as long as you are standing at my throne. Such words would burn me, spoken here. At this place words are deeds, and further deeds must follow them. But what would follow from your words? That may not be. Benedictus you are obliged to hear her. For where the word possesses action's force, it comes as the result of former deeds. The deed compelling Lucifer already has been done. Maria is my own true pupil in the spirit, and I have guided her to that maturity through which she recognized the highest spirit task. This certainly she will fulfill. Fulfillment of her duty will not fail to form the healing forces in Johannes that will release him from your realm. Maria carries in her soul a holy, solemn vow that will arouse these healing forces for the progress of the world. You soon will hear it spoken forth in words. Your aura's brilliant light gives you the magic power of opposition and power to gain by force all selfhood. If you, with strength of thought, will dim your brilliance, the healing rays that shine out of Maria's vow perhaps will be perceptible to you. These rays will shine in future with such force that their strong love will draw Johannes to their realm. <clears throat> Maria, Johannes will come here, but side by side with him who has the form of earthly souls, will also be that being whom a man bears hidden within him as a much more potent double. Were now Johannes to perceive you only as you can show yourself to him on earth, it would not give him all that he has need of for the right progress of his soul. You now shall give his double what he requires upon those spirit paths on which in future I shall guide his steps. Lucifer so must Johannes then appear to me. Well do I feel the power that you both exert. It has opposed me since the earth began. There enter at the same time, but from different sides, Johannes Tomasius and his etheric double. Tomasius, Oh, my own double image! Up to now you've only shown yourself to me so that I might be frightened at myself. I know but little of you. Still I recognize that it is you who guides my soul. You are a hindrance, therefore, to my free existence, the reason also that I cannot grasp what in reality I am. In front of Lucifer I have to hear you speak, to see what I in future shall achieve. The Double of Tomasius I could indeed come often to Johannes and bring him recognition of himself, Yet I was active only in those depths of soul which still are hidden from his consciousness. My life within his inmost soul has long since undergone important change. Maria stood beside him years ago. He thought that he was joined with her in spirit. I showed him that his instincts and his passions were actually the pilots of his soul. He understood this only as reproach. But you... Exalted bearer of the light, have shown his sensuousness the way it best may serve the spirit. But Maria, Johannes had to separate his life. Oh, excuse me, from Maria, Johannes had to separate his life. Since then he gave his efforts to strict thinking, and this has power to purify men's souls. 
what streamed forth from his purity of thought flowed over into me, I was transformed. For now I also feel his purity in me. He does not have to be afraid of me if he feels drawn back to Maria's side. But he belongs as yet to your domain. And at this moment I demand him back, for he shall now experience my being without your interference. He needs me, so that now into his thinking soul warmth and forces of the heart as well are mightily enkindled from my being. He shall once more regain himself as man. Lucifer your striving in itself is good, and yet I cannot let you do what you desire. For should I give you back now to Johannes in the same being's shape as you appeared before his soul perception years ago, he would from now on only give his love to thinking and cold knowledge. All warmth of selfhood would appear to him unfeeling, void of essence, as if dead. I cannot use my powers to make him this. Through me he must discover in himself his personality, the being that's his own. I must transform you, that the right step now is made for his own good and for his progress. Long since have I prepared what, at this time, must clearly show itself in you. Henceforth you shall appear as a quite other being. Johannes will no longer love Maria as he has loved her in the past, but he will love another with the passion and all the strength with which he once loved her. Benedictus The noble work in which we have succeeded you wish now to transform to your own use. You bound Johannes once by his heart's force to you, but now you'll see that you must make the fetters stronger still if you would hold his being in your power. Indeed, his heart is longing to submit itself completely to the Spirit. And if he comes to this, the deed which he accomplished for the sake of higher knowledge on the earth will in the future fall into the hands of powers you oppose since earth's beginning. If you succeed in changing cunningly the love felt by Johannes for Maria into the passion you have need of now for your own aims, he will, from spirit worlds, transform the good he has achieved to evil. Maria, is rescue then still possible? Johannes not destined to fall victim to those powers who want to capture for themselves his deed? Benedictus, it would take place. If all the forces stay as until now they have been able to develop, but if at the right hour you will allow your vow to take effect within your soul, those forces must in future change their course. Lucifer, so work, compelling powers, and feel, you elemental spirits, the forces of your master, and pave the way that from the realms of earth there can come forth to Lucifer's domain what my desires demand, what shall obey my will. Theodora, who calls me into realms so strange to me? I love it only when the worlds of gods are willing lovingly to show themselves, and warmth in blissful weaving round my heart draws spirit words out of my inmost soul. The Devil of Tomasius, oh, how you transform my whole existence! You have appeared, and now I am a being who only can work on, made one with you. Through me, Johannes shall belong to you. He shall from now on give to you the love which once rose in his heart so fearfully and warmly for Maria. He saw you years ago, but did not feel what even then was secretly engendered as warmth of love in deepest grounds of soul. Now it will rise and fill his being with the strength to turn his every thought to you alone. Benedictus The crucial moment now is very near. His strongest force has Lucifer unfolded. Maria, your discipleship of soul must take a stand against him mightily. Maria, you bearer of the light, 
which would restrict man's love to the advantage only of himself, you gave at earth's beginning knowledge too soon to feeble human beings. For they were destined by the gods to follow not their own but spirit will, unconsciously at first. And since that time the souls of all mankind have been the place where you combat the gods. The times are fast approaching which must bring destruction to yourself and your domain. A thinker boldly could set science free from gifts you had bestowed so that it can be offered to the gods that guide mankind. And yet you try once more yourself to take the forces destined for the gods. Because Johannes, through his deed, released out of your grasp that fruit of knowledge with which you first seduced mankind, you wish now to seduce him with a love that he, according to his destiny, should never feel for Theodora. You wish to battle wisdom now with love, as once you battled love through wisdom, but know that in the heart with which Maria now confronts you, discipleship of spirit has enkindled forces, enabling her to keep self-love apart forever from all knowledge. I shall, I never shall in future let myself be overcome by bliss, such as men feel whenever thoughts of theirs grow ripe. I will prepare my heart for sacrifice, so that my spirit only uses thinking power in order to bring forth the fruits of knowledge as an offering to the gods. Cognition will become for me a consecration, and what I bring about so actively within myself shall stream forth strongly to Johannes. Then when, in future, often in his heart, the words resound which come to him from you, his human nature shall discover it is love that gives his personality its strength, my heart will answer you with might. You once were listened to at earth's beginning when you revealed the fruits of wisdom. The fruits of love shall only be received by man when they spring forth out of the realms of gods. Lucifer I mean to fight, Benedictus, and fighting serve the gods. Thunder as the curtain falls, end of scene three. Scene four of the Guardian of the Threshold. A room in rose-red tones in the home of Strader and his wife Theodora. One notices by the arrangement of the room that they use it together, each for his own work. On Strata's work table, there are models of mechanisms. On Theodora's, things to do with mystic studies. The two are holding a conversation that shows them contemplating their seventh wedding anniversary. Strata. On this day, seven years have passed since you became the dear companion of my life, became as well the source of light for me, that shone on an existence until then ever threatened by the darkness. In spirit... I was poor, a starving man, when you came to my side and gave me everything the world had up to then withheld from me. For many years I had striven earnestly with scientific research in its strictest sense to find the values and the goals of life. I had to recognize one day quite clearly that all my striving was in vain, for I could learn from you how spirit reveals itself in man, concerned with things that had escaped my knowledge and my thought. I saw you at that time within the circle where Benedictus was the leader. I had the privilege of listening to your revelation. Then later in Tomasius I could perceive how spirit training works mightily within a human soul. What I experienced through this deprived me of my faith in reason and in science, and yet it showed me nothing then which could seem understandable to me. I turned away from any kind of thinking, and only wished to go on living aimlessly now that life seemed so utterly bereft of value. I hoped that I hoped that purely technical work to which I gave myself completely would bring benumbed forgetfulness. I lived a life of torment until I once again met you, and we became good friends. Theodora Well, can I understand why just today remembrance brings those times so vividly before your soul again. In my own heart I also feel the need to look back on those days when we were drawn together for our life. 
I felt the constant strengthening at that time of forces opening my soul to knowledge from the spirit worlds, and under Felix Balda's worthy guidance these forces reached the height that they were able to achieve just seven years ago. About that time I met Capacius one day in Felix's woodland solitude. Long years he'd had, a, he'd had of studious research and now had fought his way towards spirit training. He felt he should become familiar with my way of gazing on the spirit world. I visited him often later on, and it was in his house that meeting you I was allowed to bring some healing to your agonies of mind. Strader and then the true light shone into my soul that long had only looked into the darkness. Now I could see what spirit is in truth. You let me know what was revealed to you from higher worlds in such a way that every doubt could swiftly disappear. All this affected me so much that first I merely saw in you the mediator for the spirit. It took some time before I recognized that not alone my spirit was listening to your words, as they unveiled its true abode, but that my heart was taken captive too and could no longer do without the speaker. Theodora, when you confided to me how you felt, so strangely did you put it into words, as if not even with a single thought could you conceive of the fulfillment of the longing living in your heart. Your words seemed only seeking for good advice from a dear friend. You spoke of help of which you were in need, and of the strengthening of powers of soul that they might steady you in times of trial. Strader, <clears throat> that she who heralded the spirit could be destined also as my life companion was something far removed from all my thought when I confided in you, seeking help. Theodora, and how the words, released from heart to heart, revealed that this would be our path. It is the heart that often points out destiny. Strader. And when your heart spoke out the word of destiny, great waves of life streamed through my soul, such waves I could not quickly feel or know, but when they later rose in memory out of soul depths, they then could be experienced as radiant light. And so, because I had that memory, yet could not grasp it consciously as long as it was happening, I realized how much still separated me from actual perception of the Spirit. It was the first time that I recognized the Spirit present in my soul. It never has recurred, and yet it could in truth give certainty to me which radiates its light on my whole life. And so these seven blessed years have passed. I've been allowed to feel how all my work, technology itself, can be enriched by those whose attitude toward the Spirit world is right. Through the enlivening spirit power that you bestowed on me, I could observe the energies of natural forces with such penetration that suddenly, as if inspired, there stood created before my spirit that new and promising machine. Within your light, my soul has felt the full maturing of those forces which would have perished had I lived alone. This certainty of life that I had won helped hold me upright even when Tomasius condemned before the Rose Cross Brotherhood so startlingly his scientific work and disavowed himself with a harsh judgment the very hour that should have lifted him to his life's peak. When all the outside world appeared to show almost too many contradictions, this inner certainty sustained me, and you alone could give me this. The spirit revelation I received through you at first brought me the knowledge I had striven for, and when the revelation came no more, you stayed my spirit, you stayed my strength bestowing light of soul. Theodora, deeply pondering in a broken sentence, and when the revelation came no more, Strader, that often gravely worried me. I wondered if great pain would not result for you from loss of seership, and whether you to spare me bore it silently. But by your equanimity I saw that you in calmness bore your fate. However, recently a change has taken place. Your cheerfulness no longer shines around you, and in your eyes the glowing light has dimmed. Theodora, it could not truly pain me that spirit revelation disappeared. 
Through destiny my path had changed, and this I could accept with calmness. But now the revelation is renewed most painfully. Strader, this is the first time in these seven years that I can hardly follow you, for each experience of spirit used to be a source of inner happiness for you. Theodora, quite different is the revelation now. At first, as earlier, I felt impelled to blot out my own thinking. In former times, when I achieved this inward emptiness, a soft light would then weave around my soul, and spirit pictures wished to form themselves. But now there rises a repulsive feeling, invisibly, and I can tell quite clearly the power that I feel comes from outside, and fear comes pouring then into my soul. I cannot banish it. It takes control of me. I long for flight from that dread being that is invisible, yet most abhorrent. Filled with desire, it wants to move itself toward me, and I can only hate what is revealed. Strader, for Theodora this must be impossible. They say such an experience is usually the working of the forces of one's soul in mirror image, but your soul could not show such things as this. Theodora, reflecting slowly and painfully, I know quite well this point of view. Therefore, with all the strength still left within my soul, I let myself sink fervently into the world of spirit, and prayed that all those beings who so often once inclined themselves toward me would graciously reveal how I could find the cause of all my pain. And then the radiant light appeared as formerly it shaped itself into the image of an earthly man. It was Tomasius. Strada, deeply afflicted, overcome by the quick inrush of feelings, Tomasius, the man in whom I always wanted to believe, pause, then painfully reflecting, when I bring up before my inner being how he, confronted by the occult brotherhood, spoke there of Araman and of himself, Theodora is lost in contemplation and stares into space as if her spirit were absent. Oh, Theodora, what are you beholding now? Curtain, end of scene four. This is scene five of The Guardian of the Threshold. A room in the cottage shown in the soul's probation as Balda's home. Felicia, Felix, Capacius, Strader, later the soul of Theodora. Felicia, we shall be able to perceive her being so radiantly lovely only when we ourselves set foot within the world which took her from us all too soon. A few short weeks ago, we had the privilege here in our home still to experience how gentleness with warmth streamed through her words. Felix, we both, Felicia and I, loved her from depths of inmost soul, and so we too can understand your grief. Strader, my own dear Theodora, in her last hours she spoke indeed of Felix and Felicia, she was familiar with everything about your daily life up here. Now I must grope my further path alone. She was the substance and the meaning of my life. What she has given me will never die, and yet she is not here. Felix With you we shall send lovingly our thoughts to her in spirit worlds, and be united still with her in times to come. But I must say... It was a shock to us to hear that she had met her earthly end. During the course of years an inner sight has grown in me that quite unsought reveals at certain moments a person's inward force of life. In her case has this inner sight deceived me. I truly took for granted Theodora would be allowed for a long time to come to spread on earth that love through which she helped so many in their joy and sorrow. Strader it is most strange the way it came to pass. As long as I have known her, she has shown a sound and even disposition. 
but since the time she first became aware of something strange, unknown, that threatened her and tried to enter and oppress her mind, she grew immersed in gloomy thoughts, and sorrow poured itself through her whole being. One could observe then how some inner struggle consumed her body's strength. When often in my worry I pressed her with my questions, she said she felt herself exposed to thoughts which frightened her, affecting her like fire. And what she further spoke is terrible. In rallying her powers of thought she strove to see what caused the suffering she felt. There always came before her spirit eye Tomasius, he whom we both esteemed. And yet from this impression there remained always in her the strongest feeling, telling her that she had cause of to fear Tomasius. Capacius Tomasius and Theodora must, according to the strict decree of destiny, never meet in earthly passion. They would oppose the cosmic laws if either should feel about the other what is not founded purely in the spirit. Tomasius violates within his heart the stern decree of destiny's high powers. He should not in his soul direct toward Theodora thoughts that could cause her harm. And yet he feels what she should never feel. Excuse me. And yet he feels what he should never feel. His disobedience has formed already the forces which in future can deliver his power, his life, to powers of darkness. When Theodora had been forced to come to Lucifer's domain, she sensed unconsciously that through the spirit of the light Tomasius was filled with sensual passion for herself. Within, within that region, hostile to the gods, there came both Theodora and Maria, she to whom by powers of destiny Tomasius was entrusted in the spirit. But there Maria was to be first severed from Tomasius, and he then bound to Lucifer in future through the strength of this false love. What Theodora thus experienced grew into a consuming fire in her soul, and working further caused her all the pain. Strater, tell me, Felix, the meaning of all this? Capacius speaks so strangely of things that are incomprehensible, yet frightening and cruel to my soul. Felix, Capacius has been compelled to journey along the paths of soul, which have increasingly, from time to time, led him perforce into this most unusual spirit mood. His spirit lives in higher worlds, and passes by unnoticed all those things which through the senses whisper to man's soul. It seems, by habit only, he does all the things he used to do in daily life. He regularly visits his old friends, and whiles away long hours with them, though even at their side he only seems to be turned in upon himself. Yet what he sees in spirit has been always right, as far as my own inner research could test it for its truth. Therefore I do believe, in this case too, that on his spirit path he could receive into his inmost soul the truth of Theodora's destiny. Felicia It is so strange. He takes no notice of any conversations going on around him. It would seem as if his soul, freed from the body, gazes only into spirit worlds. And yet some word will often bring him back, out of his strange absorption, and from spirit realms he tells of things which somehow seem connected with what has just been said. At other times, whatever one may say, will pass him by as if his mind were absent. Strader, how frightful if he spoke the truth, how cruel... Theodora's soul appears. Theodora's soul. Capacius has been granted knowledge of my existence in the spirit land, and he proclaims the truth to you. We must not let Tom Tomasius succumb. Maria has already set alight the sacrifice made to the might of love by her strong heart, and Theodora from the spirit heights will send out rays of blessing from the power of love. Theodora makes the gesture of blessing. Felix, you must be silent now, dear Strader. She wants to speak to you. I understand the signs she gives to us, so listen. Theodora, 
who has made a gesture of her hand toward Strata. Tomasius has powers of seership, and he will also find me in the spirit realms. This must not come about until he searches for me, set wholly free from this dark passion. In future he will also need your help, and it is for this help I ask you now. Strata, oh, my Theodora, you are willing still to turn to me in love. Now say what you desire. It shall be done. Theodora makes a sign toward Capacius. Felix. She indicates she can no longer speak. She wants us now to listen to Capacius. Theodora's soul disappears. Capacius. Tomasius can use his spirit sight to gaze on Theodora. Therefore her death will not destroy in him the passion which is so destructive. He only must conduct himself quite differently from earlier times, when Theodora still lived within an earthly body. He'll strive with passion for the light that is revealed to her from spirit heights, although she has no longer earth-bound knowledge. Tomasius is supposed to win this light, so that through him it is received by Lucifer. For Lucifer could use the light of gods to keep within his realm forevermore the science that Tomasius has gained through earthly forces. Since earth beginning, Lucifer has sought for men who through their false desires were able to acquire the wisdom of the gods. And now he wishes to unite pure spirit vision with human knowledge, in this way transforming into evil what is good. Tomasius, however, will be turned with certainty away from evil paths if Strader gives himself to aims that in the future can change all human knowledge in a spiritual way to bring it closer to the knowledge of the gods. In order that these aims can be revealed to him, he must as pupil turn to Benedictus. A pause. Strader. O oh, Father Felix, give me your advice. Was this in truth entrusted to Capacius by Theodora, so that he could utter it to me? Felix. I often have of late held earnest converse with my own inmost self about this man, that I might clarify my thoughts. I'll gladly pass this knowledge on to you. Capacius is undergoing genuine discipleship of spirit, though it seems quite different now, if judged by his appearance. His destiny has preordained that he accomplish much in spiritual life. He only can fulfill such lofty tasks for which his soul has been selected, if now his spirit can prepare itself for them. And yet his inmost nature did not always choose to seek the light on spirit paths, preferring to devote itself to the false science that blinds so many souls today. The mighty guardian at the solemn threshold which separates the world of sense from spirit worlds, had special obligations, strong and strict, when he should find Capacius at the gate. He had to open to the earnest seeker, but then to close the gate at once behind him, because the way he earlier had acquired his forces in sense existence now prevented him from penetrating further into spirit realms. He now can best prepare for the high service he is to render in the future to mankind when he unheedingly ignores our presence. Felicia There is only one thing he still notices, and that's the fairy tales I used to tell him so often in those earlier days. Through them, whenever he felt emptied, out and stale, his thinking was refreshed and fructified. Capacius. Such stories travel also to the spirit land, if you can tell them only in the spirit. Felicia. So then, if I collect myself enough to speak my tales in silence to myself, I'll think of you with love, so that they may be audible to you as well in spirit land. The curtain falls. End of scene five. Scene 6 of The Guardian of the Threshold A space not confined by artificial walls, but closed in by intertwining plants and forms, 
which spread themselves and send out shoots toward the interior. The whole is in violent motion caused by phenomena of nature, and at times filled with storms. Capacius and Maria are on the stage when the curtain opens. Later appear Benedictus, Philea, Astrid, Luna, the other Philea, Lucifer and Arman, and beings which move in a form of dance representing thoughts. Finally, the soul of Felicia Balda. Benedictus, audible but not yet visible. Within your thinking, cosmic thoughts hold sway. Capacius, that is the solemn voice of Benedictus. His words are sounding forth in spirit here. They are the same that in the book of life are written for his pupils and that for earthly souls are hard to grasp and even harder to experience. What region of the spirit land is this where words which test men's souls on earth can sound? Maria, you've been so long now in the spirit realms, in such a way that much has been revealed and still this place remains unknown to you? Capacius, What lives here in its deepest self can easily be grasped by souls accustomed to the spirit. Each thing explains itself through something else. The whole is full of light, although the part seen by itself is often dark. But when some spiritual essence must unite with earthly being for creative work, the soul begins to lose all comprehension. Then, not alone the part, it is the whole that shrouds itself in darkness. Why at this place do words re-echo that can be found inscribed in Benedictus's Book for Men on Earth? This turns to riddles all that happens here. Benedictus, still invisible, within your feeling cosmic powers weave. Capacius Again, such words as are confided by Benedictus to his pupils on the earth and here brought into being by his voice. Arousing powers of the dark, they stream throughout unending reaches of this realm. Maria, I feel already what I should experience within the boundless reaches of this place, and Benedictus is approaching me. He wants me to behold within this region what on the earth the soul can never understand, while dwelling in a body, sense endowed even with the discipleship of spirit gained. My soul must follow him, the teacher, into regions where words cannot be coined in human speech as symbols only of the beings here, but where in cosmic happenings he calls forth the script which offers to the soul a breadth of meaning of all worlds. I will condensing forces of my soul detach my inner self from earth existence, and so await what will emerge for me as revelation of wide regions of the spirit when I turn back to life on earth. It will be thought which then in meditation will shine as knowledge in my inner soul. Benedictus appears in the background. Gain yourself in cosmic power of thought and lose yourself through life in cosmic forces. Then you will find earth goals that can reflect themselves in cosmic light through your own being. Capacious, is Benedictus here himself in spirit and not alone his words re-echoing? The spirit teacher carries earthly knowledge then to active life in regions of the spirit? What do these words here signify, to which on earth he gives a different turn? Benedictus, Capacius, you entered in your times on earth my sphere of life, though you were never consciously my pupil. Capacius, Capacius is not here at this place. His soul does not desire to hear of him. Benedictus, you do not wish to feel yourself within Capacius, and yet you must, remembering him, behold him spiritually. For you the strongly active force of thinking has unlocked spirit actuality in your soul body. 
your soul life freed itself from all the dreaming play of thought in your earth body, yet it has felt itself too weak to wander forth with it from cosmic distances into soul depths. It felt too strong to see with it the light of spirit heights through darknesses of earth alone. I must bear company with everyone who has received the spirit light from me on earth, if he, with knowledge or unconsciously, has come to me a student of the spirit, and I must guide him further on the paths on which he has set out through me. You have, through soul sight, learned how to approach the spirit knowingly in cosmic spaces, for you can follow it freed from your body. But not yet freed from thought, you cannot see your own true being in the spirit sphere. You can well lay aside your sense-bound body, but not the fine corporeal web of thought. You'll only see the world as fully real, when nothing of your personality remains to dim the clearness of your vision. He only who has learned to see his thinking outside himself, just as the powers of seership behold the body as a thing apart, can penetrate to spirit actualities. Behold now thoughts in image form, in order that the image be changed through your seer forces into knowledge. Such thoughts that shape themselves in space as beings change then to forms that mirror human thinking. A Friendly Subdued Light by Leah, Astrid and Luna appear in a glimmering cloud. Capacius and Maria leave the stage. Voices, Philea, Astrid, and Luna, speaking in chorus. Now thoughts hover near, like weaving of dreams, arising as beings essential to souls, self-quickening will, self-wakening feeling, self-mastering thinking, emerge for the dreamer. As this resounds, Lucifer enters from one side, Aramon from the other, taking their places on either side of the stage. Lucifer, in a strong measured tone, emphasizing every word. Within your willing, cosmic beings work. From Lucifer's side, beings representing thoughts draw near. They carry out movements in a dance-like manner, representing thought forms corresponding to the words of Lucifer. Aramon also in a strong measured tone, but roughly. The cosmic beings are confusing you. In accord with these words, thought beings from the side of Aramon move and carry out dance movements corresponding in forms to his words. After this, the motions of both groups are performed in unison. Lucifer, within your feeling, cosmic forces weave. The thought beings on Lucifer's side repeat their movements. Araman, the cosmic forces are misleading you. The thought beings on Araman's side repeat their movements. Then both groups move again in unison. Lucifer, within your thinking, cosmic thoughts hold sway. Repetition of the motions by Lucifer's group. Araman, the cosmic thoughts are disconcerting you. Repetition of the motions by Araman's group. Then four times a repetition of the movements of each group by itself and three times in unison. The thought beings disappear left and right. Lucifer and Araman remain. Philea, Astrid, and Luna come forward again out of the background and speak the words spoken before with the following alteration. So thoughts hovered near, like weaving of dreams arising as beings, essential to souls, self-quickening will, self-wakening feeling, self-mastering thinking emerged for the dreamer. Philea, Astrid, and Luna disappear. Capacius enters again, and after he has spoken a few words, 
Maria approaches, remaining at first invisible to him. Capacious. The soul lives out its life within itself, believing that it thinks because it cannot see thoughts spread out in front of it in space, believing that it feels because the feelings do not flash forth out of the clouds like lightning. It sees the realms of space and it perceives the clouds above it, and were this not so, if lightnings were to flash and no eye looked on them, it would believe the lightnings must be in itself. It sees not Lucifer, from whom thoughts spring to life, and from whom feelings flow. Thus it believes it is alone with them. Why does it give itself to such illusion? O oh, soul, give, your, give answer to yourself, yet from where? Out of yourself? Oh, do not dare. Perhaps the answer, too, is not from you, from Lucifer. Maria, and if it were, why then should you not at seek? Descend into the depths to find it there. Capacious, a being who is able to hear souls. M Maria, the souls here are indeed not separate. That happens only when they use a body. Here each one hears himself in others' words. And thus you say it to yourself when I say this. Search for the answer in the depths. Capacious. Oh, in the depths, there threatens darkest fear. Maria, yes, truly it is there. Yet ask yourself, since you have forced yourself into its realm, if clearly it reveals itself to you, and ask of Lucifer whom you are facing if he is pouring fear into your weakness. Lucifer, all those who flee from me love me as well. The children of the earth have always loved me. They think, however, they should hate me and yet they seek me for my deeds. They would have pined away in bounds of frigid truth throughout the earth's becoming if I had not sent down into their souls beauty as life's adornment. I fill the artist's soul with my creative power. Wherever men perceive the beautiful, it has its archetype within my realm. Now ask yourself, should you fear me? Maria in Lucifer's domains, in truth, fear is not in its rightful place. The gifts he sends into men's souls are the desires, but certainly not fear. Fear comes from quite another sphere of power. Araman. In rank I was once equal to the gods, but they curtailed perforce my ancient rights. I wished to mould the human beings, so for brother Lucifer and for his realm that each should bear his own world in himself. But Lucifer could only show himself in spirit realms as equal among equals, a model only, never a ruler over beings. I wanted therefore to give strength to man, to prove himself to Lucifer as equal. And had I stayed within the realms of gods, this would have happened in primeval times. The gods, however, willed to be the rulers upon earth. They had to ban my power out of their realm into the deep abyss that I should not empower men too strongly. Now only from this region am I able to send my mighty power toward the earth. It turns, however, on the way to fear. With Araman's last words, Benedictus appears. Capacious, he who has heard what these two mighty ones spoke from their places, sounding through the cosmos, has hereby learned the way to search and find both fear and hate in their own realms. Benedictus, in cosmic words now recognize yourself and feel yourself in cosmic powers of thought. Since you could see outside yourself what you were dreaming as your selfhood, so find yourself and shudder not in future to hear this word that rightfully resounds and should confirm to you your own existence. Capacious. 
I may be long in future to myself again. Now I will seek myself, because I dare, beholding myself in cosmic thought, to live. Benedictus, and bind what you have won to everything you formerly achieved for world enrichment. In the background, Felicia Balda appears at Benedictus's side in her ordinary garb. Felicia, in a thoughtful voice, suitable for fairy tales. Once upon a time there lived a light-filled child of gods. It was akin to beings who, with foresight, weave in spirit realms the web of wisdom. Cared for by Father Truth, the child grew up within its world to primal power and when it felt the ripened will bestir itself creatively within its limbs of light, it often looked with pity toward the earth, where human souls were longing for the truth. Then spoke the child of light to Father Truth, Men thirst, O Father, for the drink which you can offer them out of your springs. And Father Truth with earnestness replied, The springs which I must guard let light stream forth from spirit suns, and only those may drink the light who never need to thirst for air to breathe. On light, therefore, I have brought up the child who feels compassion for the souls on earth and can engender light in breathing beings. So go, my child, and wend your way to men and lead the light within them, spirit kindled confidently forth to meet my light. Thereon the bright light being made its way to souls who feel their life by breathing. It found good men in numbers on the earth who offered its soul lodging joyously. In faithful love it turned their gaze unto the Father at the springs of light. Now when this being heard from human lips and happy human minds imagination as magic word, it felt itself received with joy by friendly human hearts. One day, however, there approached this being, a man who cast on it quite strange and chilling looks. I turn on earth the souls of men toward Father Truth, who tends the springs of light. Thus spoke this being to the unknown man. Then spoke the man, You weave wild dreams in human spirits and deceive their souls. And since that day, which saw this come to pass, right many a man heaps slander on this being that can bring light into the souls that breathe. Philea, Astrid, and Luna, and the other Philea appear in a cloud of light. Philea, let the soul find itself by drinking the light in cosmic expanses, awakened to power. Astrid, let the spirit, by knowing no fear, feel itself in cosmic unfoldment arising with power. Luna, let him who aspires to reach to the heights in life's firm foundations sustain himself strongly. The other Philea, let man struggle on to the bearer of light who unlocks for him worlds that liven and quicken glad senses in man. Inspired admiring will lead on the spirit to regions of gods that waken a radiant beauty in souls. Achievement consoles those feelings that dare to step toward the thresholds which strictly are guarded from souls that feel fear and energy finds a will that grows ripe to face without fear the powers creative sustaining the worlds. The curtain falls while all who are in the scene remain standing in their places. The end of scene six. Scene seven of The Guardian of the Threshold A Landscape of Fantastic Forms Majestic in its composition of whirling masses of water forming themselves into shapes on one side, of blazing whirls of fire on the other. In the center a chasm out of which fire blazes forth, towering up to form a kind of portal. Behind it mountain-like contours formed of fire and water. The guardian, Tomasius, Maria, 
later Lucifer, then the other Philea. The Guardian What violent desires are here resounding! So rage men's souls that are approaching me before achieving full serenity. Such beings are impelled by strong desires, not by the power which dares to speak creatively, because it could create itself in silence. The souls which show themselves in such a way I must send back to earth, for in the spirit regions they provoke confusion only and disturb the deeds which cosmic powers wisely preordain. To their own being also they do damage. They breed destructive urges in themselves, which they mistake then for creative power, for they must take illusion for the truth, when earthly darkness shelters them no more. Tomasius and Maria appear. Tomasius, you see upon your threshold not the soul who came here often as Tomasius, the spirit pupil of Benedictus, although it still must call Tomasius's form on earth its own. He came to you filled with a thirst for knowledge. He could not bear your presence. He wrapped himself, perceiving you, into his selfhood. Thus he often gazed into such worlds as seemed to show to him the origin of all existence and the significance of life. He found in them the blissfulness of knowledge, found also forces that inspired the artist to follow with his heart and hand these traces of creation. They led him to the firm belief that cosmic powers were unsealed to him, their actions caught in what he painted. He did not know that nothing rose before him in what he could creatively imagine except the content of his own soul-being. And like the spider that will spin itself into its web, he molded his own self and felt himself to be a universe. Once he believed it was in truth Maria confronting him in spirit, yet he saw the picture only she had first engraved into his soul, which showed itself as spirit. And when he was allowed for fleeting moments a glimpse of his own being as it really was, he gladly would have fled away from self. He thought himself to be in spirit, but he found his inmost nature was united with his blood. He learned to know the power of this blood. This was reality, the rest imagination. His blood alone gave him true spirit vision. It was his real teacher. It revealed to him who had in long past times on earth once been his father, been his sister. His blood led him to blood relationships. He knew then how the human soul must greatly be deceived by the desire to lift itself in vanity from matter to the spirit. Such striving binds the soul in truth more firmly to matter than a daily life in which men dreamingly, half-conscious, spend their days. And when Tomasius could view all this as his own state, he gave himself with vigor to that power which could not deceive him, even though it showed itself as semblance. For he realized that Lucifer remains a real being, even though he can only show himself in image form. The gods alone approach man in reality, but Lucifer remains himself, regardless of whether he is seen in truth or error. Therefore I also recognize that I indeed can sense reality, when I believe that I must find the soul which Lucifer attached to me while in his kingdom. Armed with the strength bestowed on me by Lucifer, I mean to force my way past you to Theodora. She is, I know, within the realm beyond this threshold. The Guardian Tomasius, reflect on what you know. What is to be perceived beyond this threshold is quite unknown to you and yet you are familiar with all I must demand before you can set foot into this realm. You must first separate yourself from many forces you have acquired within your earthly body. You can retain of them that force alone which you achieved through pure and spiritual striving and which has kept its purity. 
but this you have yourself cast off from you and rendered as his own to Araman. What still belongs to you is spoiled for spirit worlds by Lucifer. I must deprive you of it here, if you would cross this threshold rightfully. Thus you have nothing left, a being you will be without being, when you find yourself in spirit. Tomasius, yet I shall be, and then find Theodora. She has to be the source to me of perfect light that always can reveal itself so richly without an earth-bound knowledge of, to her soul. That is enough. You will in vain oppose me, even though the power I acquired on the earth may not conform to the opinion you once formed of the goodness of my spirit. Maria, it is well known to you, who's had to guard the threshold of this realm since earth's beginning, just what the beings of your kind and time must have in order to pass through, and also men who here encounter you have to turn back to life on earth if they are bringing but themselves alone and cannot offer genuine spirit substance. But now Johannes was allowed to bring with him to you and to your threshold here this other soul who is so closely bound to him by destiny. You are ordained by highest spirit powers to bar the way for many human beings who drawing near the portal of this realm would only bring destruction to themselves if they would pass beyond the threshold. But you may open wide the gate for those who turn their inmost self to purest love and permeate themselves with it completely. Such love your gods had preordained for them before the battle Lucifer began to wage. My heart has vowed before the throne of Lucifer to render service to this love so that no harm may come to it in future times on earth from the cognition that streams from Lucifer into men's souls. And human beings always must be found who listen to what gods reveal to them of purest love as once they listened to the words of Lucifer about cognition. Johannes, in his earthly body, no longer listens to my voice as once he listened in our earthly lives long past. I could reveal to him what was entrusted to me within Hibernia's hallowed places about the God who dwells in man and who has conquered powers of death because he brought to life within himself love's very essence. My friend will hear again in spirit realms out of my soul the word for which his earthly hearing has been deafened by Lucifer and his deluding powers. Tomasius, as one who spiritually beholds a being. Maria, do you see dressed in long robes that dignified old man with solemn face, his forehead noble, radiant his glance? He walks through narrow, crowded streets, and everyone in reverence makes way for him, so that he may pursue his path in quiet, and his train of thought not rudely be disturbed. For one can see him musing, powerful in inward thought, upon essential things. Maria, do you see him? Maria, yes, I can see him, when I behold him with the, your eyes of soul. He wishes at this moment to show himself to you alone in images of deep significance. <clears throat> Damasius, I now can look into his very soul. Something of great importance lives within its depths, a memory of what he just has heard. A teacher filled with wisdom stands before his eyes, and through his soul flow words he's heard from this great teacher from whom he just has come. His thoughts touch on the sources of all being, that men on earth once had true spirit vision, although their inner life was as a dream. The old man's soul is following trains of thought that he, he's received from the exalted teacher, and now he disappears from inner sight. Oh, could I but behold him further? Among the crowd I see some men conversing. I hear their words. They speak of the old man with reverence. He was in earlier years a valiant warrior, 
whose soul was burning with ambition and desire. He wished to count as foremost fighter in the ranks. He had committed countless cruelties while he bore arms. His one wish was to shine. There were some periods in his life in which he caused much blood to flow. At last there came the time when in the field his fortune suddenly deserted him. He rode from combat in disgrace and shame back to his homeland. Scorn and ridicule were heaped on him, and from that time wild hatred filled his soul, which had not lost its pride nor its ambition. He saw in his own people only enemies, to be destroyed at the first chance. But soon, since his proud soul had to confess that he could not wreak vengeance on his foes within his lifetime, he controlled himself. He overcame all pride and lust for fame. Although he now was old, he still resolved to join a little group of students that at that time was forming in his city. The teacher of this group possessed within his soul the love and wisdom which, by the masters of primeval times, were handed down to the initiates. All this I hear from men among the crowd. I feel the warmest love when I direct my inner sight toward this old man, who first gained victories through love of fame and then achieved the greatest victory men can, the conquest of himself. Why do I, in this place, behold the man to whom I wholly give myself, although he only stands there as a vision? The feelings that are mastering me do not arise out of this single moment. Through many lives long past I must be bound to this soul-being whom I love like this. I have not merely at this moment aroused within myself this love I feel that is so powerful. It must be a remembrance of ancient times, though thoughts can hardly grasp these feelings yet. My memory calls them up for me. I must have been the pupil of this man, full of awe, looked up to him. Oh, at this moment, how I long to find the earthly soul again that called this body once its own, find it on earth or else in other realms. I'll prove to it how strong my love still is. I, it can renew in me good powers only, which worthily once shaped such human bonds. Maria And are you also sure, Johannes, that this soul, if it now draws near to you, will show itself upon the same bright peak on which it stood in those far distant times that rise in image form before your soul? Perhaps it is now fettered uh, by emotions not worthy of the one it used to be. Many a human being walks the earth who would behold with bitter shame how little in this present life there is that corresponds to what he did before. Perhaps this man is moved now by wild passions and lust, and you would see him only with grief and consternation. Tomasius, why do you say all this, Maria? I cannot understand what prompts you. Do thoughts move here in ways quite different from those in places known to men? The Guardian. Johannes, what reveals itself here, at this place, is a probation of your soul. Look down into the deepest layers of your being. This you have not in consciousness desired to do, and yet you well are able to. What in your depths hid from you while you lived in inner blindness... Parenthesis, Lucifer appears, parenthesis, will now appear before you and will rob you of the protecting darkness that you dwelt in. This is the guardian continuing to speak. So recognize what human soul it is for whom you long with such a feverish love, who lived within the body that you saw, perceive to whom you give your strongest love. Lucifer, immerse yourself in depths of being, and recognize the strongest powers of your soul. Now learn to know how strength of love can hold you upright in the progress of the world. Tomasius, yes, I can sense indeed the soul that wished to show itself to me. Theodora, she it was, who wanted to reveal herself to me. She came to me because I shall behold her when soon this portal will be opened up to me. I am allowed to love her, that her soul confronted me within the other body's form, 
proves it is she that I must love. In you alone I now will rediscover myself and conquer in your strength my future. The Guardian I cannot keep you back from what you have to do. As a vision you already saw that soul which you love best. You shall behold it once again when you have passed beyond the threshold. Perceive it and find out if it remains for you as beneficial as now you dream that it will be. The Other Philea Oh, do not listen to the solemn guardian. He leads you into desert spheres of life and robs you of your warmth of soul. He can behold but spirit beings and knows not human suffering, which souls can only bear if earthly love protects them from the cold of cosmic reaches. Austerity belongs to him, and gentleness escapes him. The powers of desire he has detested since earth's beginning. Curtain, the end of scene 7. Scene 8 of The Guardian of the Threshold Araman's kingdom, a dark gorge enclosed by mountains that tower up in fantastic forms out of black rock masses. Skeletons appear everywhere as though crystallized, whitely out of the rocks. Araman stands on a rocky slope. Hilary and Frederick Troutman enter, then Strader and the twelve persons gathered in scene one, later Tomasius and Maria, the guardian, and finally the double of Tomasius. Friedrich Troutman How often now I've visited this realm, and yet how horrible it always seems that we should come down here to get advice for enterprises that our brotherhood considers of importance for our goals. Hilary But every seed must first succumb to death before the life can spring from it again. In this place everything is to be found that has been used up in the life on earth. It is transformed down here to something new. <clears throat> and if our brotherhood will plant such seeds as ripen into deeds in future times, then it must fetch them from the realm of death. Fried Friedrich Troutman The Lord who rules this place seems sinister, and if it were not written in our books, which are the greatest treasure of our temple, that the being we encounter here is good, one might suspect that he was evil. Hilary, not books alone, my spirit vision too tells me that what he can reveal is good. Araman, in a disguised voice. I know just why you two have come again. You want to learn from me just how you can direct the soul that many times has stood upon your threshold. Since you regard Tomasius as lost, you think that Strader now will be the man to serve you for the mystic brotherhood. All he has mastered of the nature forces, and given to the progress of mankind, he owes to me, for I am in command, where forces that are useful in mechanics receive their power from creative sources. Thus all that he may still invent for man will come back in the end to my account but this time I myself will take in charge the thing that must be done for Strader in the future, for in Tomasius' case your work brought only loss to me and my designs. If you desire to serve the spirit powers, why, first you still have to acquire what you allowed in this case to be lacking. Araman becomes invisible. Friedrich Troutman, after a pause during which he withdraws into himself, Respected Master, I am greatly troubled. I have tried a long time to suppress my worry, because the strict rules of our brotherhood demanded I should treat it thus. But many things I notice in our order make my soul struggle difficult for me. I wanted always to subordinate, thankfully, my own darkness to the light that you could give by virtue of your powers. But when I saw, as frequently I did, that you were really utterly deceived, and that your words were proved by the events gravely in error from the very outset, I felt as though a dreadful nightmare were pressing painfully upon my soul. And now again your words fall into error 
for you believed that here we certainly would hear some good things from this spirit. Hilary, the cosmic ways are hard to understand. Dear brother, it behooves us now to wait until the spirit shows us the direction that is in keeping with our whole endeavor. Exit Hilary and Troutman, Araman, who has reappeared. They see me, but they do not recognize me. For if they knew who is the ruler here, they never would have come here for advice. And persons who were known to visit me, they would condemn to suffer in hell fire. The group of people enter, who in scene one were assembled in the anteroom of the Brotherhood. But it is made plain that they are blind when they enter the realm of Araman. What they say is what lives in each soul, although they are unaware of it. They are experiencing in sleep unconscious dreams, which become audible in Araman's realm. Strader, however, who enters at the same time, is half aware of what is happening to him, so that he is able to recall it later. Strader. The hints that Benedictus gave to me, that I should cultivate my power of thought, have led me to this kingdom of the dead. I hoped, when lifted to the spirit, to receive the truth from radiant worlds of wisdom. Araman. The wisdom you can learn in this domain will be sufficient for a long, long time, if you conduct yourself accordingly. Strater, what spirit is my soul confronting now? Araman, you'll know him later, when your memory brings back to mind what you experience here. Strater, and then why do I find these people here in your dark realm? Araman, they only come as souls into this place, and they know nothing in the least about themselves. For all this time they can be found, submerged in deepest sleep at home. But all that lives within their souls will be revealed quite clearly here, though they themselves are scarce aware of it when they are awake. Also they cannot hear what we are saying. Louis Furchtegott the soul should not believe, in blind devotion, that it can raise itself in prideful power up to the light, unfolding its full essence. I will acknowledge only what I know. Araman, audible only to Strader. You do not know how blindly you are leading yourself with prideful power into darkness. She'll serve you, Strader, right well, in the work that you'll achieve in future with my forces. For this she does not need belief in spirit, a thing unsuited to her haughtiness. Aside from me, I think it's Louise work to God above a woman speaking. Okay, next, Friedrich Geist. Alluring are the ways the mystics follow. I will in future never lack in zeal, but will devote myself to all the wisdom that can be gathered from the temple's words. Michael Edelman My soul's demand for truth is guiding me toward the Spirit's light. The noble teachings that so illuminate our human life will surely find in me the best of pupils. George Varmunt I am always deeply moved by everything that is revealed to me from varied sources about the spirit treasures of the mystics. With all my heart I will continue striving. Araman, audible only to Strata. They mean it well, but all their striving sits in superficial layers of their souls, and so I will be able to employ for many years still all the treasures lying unconscious in their spiritual depths. They also will be useful to my goal, that Strata's work develop brilliantly within the life of men upon the earth. Maria Treufels a healthy view of life will of itself produce the fruits of spirit in the soul if men unite a reverence for the world with sharp-eyed sense for all reality. Araman, audible only to Strata. She speaks in dreams about reality. She dreams so much the better when awake. Thus she will serve me badly now, 
although in her next life, perhaps, she'll do much better. She will then be an occultist, and on request describe for all and sundry their lives since the beginning of the earth. But loyalty's not in her. In one life on earth she scolded Stader viciously, while now she praises him. That's how things go. She will give Lucifer more cause for joy. Francesca de Mut I think that mysticism, sought in earnest, will reshape human nature to a whole if thoughts allow the feelings proper scope and feelings let themselves be led by thoughts. Katharina Ratsam I must admit men strive to see the light, but do it often in the strangest way. First they extinguish it, and then they wonder why they can nowhere find it in the dark. Araman, audible only to Strader. These are the souls in whom a well-turned phrase provokes the feeling that the world goes well, but firmness is entirely lacking in them. They're really inaccessible to me, but in the future they'll do many things that can be fruitful for my ends. They are by no means what they think they are. Bernard Redlich. If cautions lacking in the search for knowledge... Our fancy brings in castles in the air as answers to the riddles of the world, though rigorous thinking is what they demand. Hermine Hauser Things in the world must be in ceaseless flux if life's potentials fully realized. If you would keep things as they've always been, you lack the strength for understanding life. Kaspar Sturmer to live in fantasies can only be to rob the soul of just the forces needed to give it strength to render here on earth the service needed by itself and others. Marie Kühne A soul that is content to drift along will let itself be shaped by outer forces. A man becomes a personality by working out what's hidden in his soul. Araman, audible only to Strader. What's hidden in their souls is only human. One cannot tell what they may yet achieve. I'll leave them to the wiles of Lucifer, for he can make them actually believe that they have mighty forces in their souls, and thus, perhaps, they're not pure loss for him. Ferdinand Reinecke The one who wants to fathom cosmic riddles should wait till understanding and good sense develop in him of their own accord. And he who wants to find his way in life must seize what profits him and gives him joy. To value wisdom above earthly things and preach of lofty goals to feeble men leads absolutely nowhere on this earth. Araman, audible only to Strata, this fellow is a born philosopher and really will be one in his next life. With this one the account is balanced out. Of twelve, I must have seven for myself. And five, I'll give to Brother Lucifer. From time to time I take a look at men and study how they are, what they can do. But when I once have picked out twelve of them, I need not go on searching any more. For when I come to thirteen in my count, the last is clearly equal to the first. So if I can lure twelve into my kingdom with all their different kinds of soul, others will surely follow after them. <coughs> to himself, holding his hands over Strada's ears to keep him from hearing. I must confess, I have not yet succeeded. The earth would not surrender to my will, but I will strive on through eternity until perhaps I gain the victory. One must make use of all that is not lost. The following is again audible to Strada. You see, I do not speak in pretty words. I am never anxious to please anyone. If you would like, by elegant orations, to stir enthusiasm for your aims, you'd best betake yourself to other worlds. But if with reason and a sense for truth you see the things that happen here through me, then you will know that here are to be found the forces without which the sons of men must lose themselves in life upon the earth. Even the world of gods has need of me, for gods seduce the souls away from me, only when I have worked within their depths. And if my adversaries then succeed, making men believe that my existence can be dispensed with in the universe, 
then souls will dream indeed of higher worlds, but genuine force will die away on earth. Strader. You see in me a soul who might be able to follow you and give its strength to you. What I have seen and heard here seems to show that only lack of common sense and reason lets men become your adversaries. You surely did not speak in pretty words. You seemed well pleased almost to mock these people as you described their future destinies. I must confess that what you want to give to human souls appears to me as good. They'll gain in strength through you if they are good, and if instead they should become more evil, it will be only when the evil's there already. Your mocking even could be well applied by men to their own weaknesses with profit, if they could only better know themselves. But what is this that's bursting out of me? The words that I have spoken would destroy me if on the earth I found them all correct. You must think thus, and I can only find all that you said just now to be the truth. But only in this place is it the truth. For the earthly world it is all error. If there it proves to be what here it seems, I may not here go further with my human thinking, for it is at its end. In your rough words there is the sound of pain in you, and they cause pain in me as well. I must lament, beholding you can only weep. Exit quickly. Maria and Tomasius enter. Both are fully conscious, so that they can hear all that happens and can speak consciously. Tomasius. Maria, fear is flashing out all round me. It's closing in and presses hard upon me. Where will I find the strength to fight against it? Maria. My holy, solemn vow radiates strength. If you will feel its healing influence, your soul can soon endure the pressure. Arman to himself. They have been sent to me by Benedictus. He guided them so that they'll recognize me when in my realm they come to feel my presence. He speaks what follows in such a way that Tomasius and Maria can hear him. Tomasius, the guardian, had to guide you into my kingdom. Here the first steps that you made to find the light within the depths of your own nature. And I can give you truth, although with pain, pain such as I too suffer for long ages. Because although the truth can find me here, it first must separate itself from joy before it dares to venture through my portals. Tomasius Then I will have to see without delight the soul I ardently desire to see. Araman, wishes content you only when soul warmth can nourish them, but here they freeze and have to live in coldness evermore. Maria, and I must lead my friend into the empty, unmelting fields of ice, where now bursts free from bonds the light that must be formed by spirits, when the force of life is lamed by darkness. Now, Tomasius, feel your strength. The guardian appears on the threshold. Araman, the guardian himself must bring the light that you have so ardently... Excuse me, let me read that again. The guardian himself must bring the light that you have been so ardently desiring. Tomasius, I shall be able to see Theodora. The guardian, the soul that on my threshold stood before you within that body sheath, that once it wore upon the earth so many years ago, has in this solemn hour of your life enkindled in your deepest soul foundations the strongest love concealed within you. While you still stood outside the realm I guard and first requested that I grant admission, that soul appeared to you in picture form, and pictures are illusions only if they're born of wish. Now you shall see in truth the soul that in a long past life once dwelt in that old man you saw. Thomasius. Again I see him, 
dressed in the long robe that grave old man with earnest countenance. O oh, soul that lived once in this earthly sheath, why do you hide yourself so long from me? It must, it can be only Theodora. Now the reality is taking shape, out of distorted images. Theo, myself. At the syllables Theo, the double enters. The double, coming quite close to Tomasius. Know what I am. Behold yourself in me, Maria, and I may follow you to cosmic depths in which souls fight their way to a true feeling of gods through all destroying victories that boldly from destruction wrench new life, rolls of thunder and increasing darkness. The end of scene 8. Scene 9 of The Guardian of the Threshold A pleasant, sunny, morning landscape. In the background, a city with many factories. Capacius, Benedictus, Strader, Maria, Tomasius engage freely in conversation while walking back and forth. Capacius alone. Here is the place where Benedictus, so often in the morning sunlight, gives his time generously to his students, and they may, in a mood of consecration, receive his words of wisdom. Far off there lies what cruelly must sever the souls of men from all the glorious beauty displayed by God-created nature as a blessing. In the vast stony desert of that city is Benedictus always occupied in healing sorrow by his deeds of love. But when he speaks in words of wisdom about the world of spirit to his students, he wishes to find hearts unlocked by the free powers of creation here in nature, which, like the sun, reveal themselves, awakening souls. I, too, am now allowed to share the happiness his words can bring to all who hear them. He lovingly took on the spirit burden of guiding me into the spirit world, and so I feel when I am near him that I have been returned to my own self. Benedictus joins Capacius. There shall, through your free deed in future and deeds of others in the circle of my students, a knot be loosened, formed by threads that karma spins in earth becoming. All you experienced must serve this loosening. In human hearts, which follow with devotion the spirit guidance that I serve. Myself, your strength, can find the helpers, joined with whom you will complete the work for which you were prepared in spirit. Capacius, I've learned to know you, and I'll follow you. When I had been allowed to hear your words as beings in the spirit worlds, and you had brought me to myself again, I held communion with my soul. Then I perceived within the spirit light the goals toward which, in progress of the earth, my future lives shall be devoted. I am convinced by now you chose to show to me the paths that I should take. Benedictus United with you, Strader and Tomasius, in future, will be able to accomplish much for the right progress and the good of men. The forces of the soul which they possess have been prepared since Earth's beginning, in such a way that in the cosmic course they can unite now with your spirit to form a triad filled with strength. Capacius, so I must thank my destiny's stern powers, which had to be at first incomprehensible, that they at the right moment showed me clearly the aims that make my life now meaningful. He pauses, pondering. How wondrous was your guidance! It seemed at first as if I strove in vain to enter with my spirit consciously those worlds your words had put before my soul in concept form. When in your books I labored deeply for many years I could find only thoughts, and then, quite suddenly, I had around me the spirit world in its reality. I hardly knew then how to find myself aright in my accustomed earlier world. Benedictus, through its effective power, 
this former world would always have concealed from you the life of spirit, unless the stronger nature of this spirit life had not subdued the world of sense into a thin and shadow-like existence. You, therefore, with full spirit vision, must perceive yourself upon the threshold which for others opens first the eyes of soul. During the last words of Capacius, Strato joins them. The three go away together, and after a short time Benedictus returns with Strato. Strato. Deep pain I felt within my inner being, mounting like heavy pressure on the soul, when, on awakening, I recognized myself again within the body from which your words had guided me. I was tormented first by my, fir- by my half-conscious soul life, yet it was more than torment, for it brought forth the memory of all I had lived through before I saw with terror what I have just learned from Araman. All thinking must come to a standstill there. And then I had to ask myself, why did the words of Benedictus take me into that realm where souls are merely counted and where each soul is valued for its help toward that power's aims to shape to his own purposes what I have done? He, in his wisdom, wanted to select from the full count of men twelve for his work. Benedictus You surely know quite well why all these souls displayed by Araman drew near to you when he by force intruded in their destinies. Strater, This, too, my pain made very clear to me. It showed how in an earthly life long past I was connected with an order which now has formed the occult brotherhood. It showed, too, my relationship to all those people who revealed their actual selves, and I could feel that Araman intends to use these ties, which in our future lives must firmly bind their souls to mine. Benedictus The cosmic powers guide their deeds, so that in strict accord with measure and with number they follow wisely cosmic progress. The outer token of this ordering shows itself clearly in the earthly senses when they observe the sun upon the course it takes through the twelve stellar constellations. The way that it relates itself to these reveals how on the earth things come to pass in the successive periods of time. So Araman desired to use those souls who are united with you for energies from which your work can radiate forth. He wished by measure and by number to bind your own soul fast to theirs. Strader, since I have learned to understand the meaning of number and of measure, I'll succeed in rescuing my work from Araman's domain and offering its results to gods of earth. Benedictus, you've had to recognize the sense of number within the universe through power of Araman. This way was necessary for your soul. Your spirit training led you to this realm which you must recognize if your creative power shall rightly blossom forth. The two walk away. From the other side Maria and Tomasius enter. Maria. Johannes, you have conquered and brought knowledge out of the icy realms of truth, and you'll no longer weave in images as souls live them like dreams within their bodies, for far from cosmic progress are the thoughts that merely self-begotten come to life. Tomasius. And that they do so springs from love of self, pretending to be thirst for knowledge. Maria, whoever wants to dedicate himself to human progress and perform such works as prove essential forces in the course of time must first entrust himself to just those powers which bring in deep realities measure and number into the battle between order and confusion. Knowledge in truth will only come to life and manifest itself within the soul if it can bring to men in earthly bodies the memory of life in spirit realms. Tomasius, my course of life is then marked out for me. All that I am, I have to feel as double nature. Through Benedictus and your help, I am a being that exists apart, whose forces do not yet belong to my own nature, stirring still within me. 
What both of you have given me is for itself a human being who must give willingly to other men what has been granted him through spirit training. He shall devote himself now to the world as best he can, but with this new man in him nothing of the other one must mingle, the one who senses that he only is at the beginning of a true self-knowledge. Contained in his own world, he will go on, if his own strength and if your help enable him to shape in future his own destiny. Maria, whether you walk your path in truth or error, you can keep ever clear the view ahead so that your soul is able to pursue its way. For this you must with courage bear necessities stemming from the nature of the spirit realm. Curtain, end of scene 9. The tenth and last scene of the Guardian of the Threshold. The Temple of the Occult Brotherhood that appeared in scenes 1 and 2. Standing in the east are Benedictus and Hilary. In the south, Bellicosus and Torquatus. In the west, Troutman. Then enter Tomasius, Capacius, Strader, Maria, Felix, and Felicia Balda. Later, the soul of Theodora. And finally, the four soul forces. Benedictus. My pupils have unlocked their souls, each in his own way, in order to receive the spirit light according to his destiny. What they have conquered for themselves, each one shall render fruitful for the others. But this can only happen if their powers in harmony of measure and of number form willingly a higher unity together at this sacred place. This unity alone can waken to true life what otherwise could merely stay as single bare existences. They stand upon the threshold of this temple. So may their separate souls now join themselves to sound in unison, attesting to the principle recorded in the book of cosmic destiny, that harmony of spirits may achieve what each alone could never bring about. These will bring something new to what is old and has so nobly ruled since earliest times. To you, dear brothers, I present these pupils who have had to take their paths through worlds of spirit and through their soul probations to this place. They'll honor reverently the ancient customs and ancient holy mystic rites, which here are manifest as power of spirit light. To you, who have so long and faithfully discharged your solemn duties to the Spirit, will other work be given in the future. Now sons of men are called by cosmic destiny into the sacred temples for a certain time, and it will summon them to other tasks when in this service they exhaust their strength. The temple even faced its own probation when in a cosmic moment fraught with destiny the error of one man had to protect this guardian of the light against the darkness. Tomasius recognized by way of knowledge that lives unconsciously in human souls. His journey to this sacred temple could never carry him beyond its threshold before he stepped across that other one, of which this portal here is but a symbol. So voluntarily he shut the door which you in kindness would have opened wide, He now returns, transformed to you, in worthy manner, to receive your consecration. Hilary, our souls give humbly to the Spirit here what will bear fruit within men's inmost being. We strive to let our own will be the revelation of the Spirit will. The temple's guidance is the cosmic wisdom which resolutely leads us to the future. You point out the direction you could read within the book of cosmic destiny as your pupil, as your disciples passed through their probation. So let them enter now this sacred place, that they may join their work with ours. After Hilary knocks three times, there enter the temple Tomasius, Capacius, Strader, Maria, Felix, and Felicia Balda. Troutman and Torquatus lead them in so that Tomasius takes his place in front of Benedictus and Hilary, Capacius in front of Bellicosus and Torquatus, Strater in front of Troutman, Maria Felix and Felicia Balda take their places in the center. Hilary to Tomasius, My son, 
The words one utters at this place give rise, if truth alone does not direct the speaker, to spirit guilt, which rends the spirit worlds with cries. As great the guilt, as great also the forces arising from the guilt that will strike down the speaker who is unworthy of this office. Aware of the effect of temple words, the one who stands before you did his best, to the last limit of his strength, to serve the spirit at this holy symbol of the light that shines out of the east upon the earth. It is the will of destiny that you shall henceforth hold this place in spirit service. The one who has the obligation to ordain you and hand to you the key of his high office gives you with this his blessing. May it prove for you of service in so far as he himself has served the sacred customs worthily. Tomasius, exalted master, it would be presumptuous of the frail mortal now permitted to stand before you bodily to wish he might succeed you in your office within this age-old consecrated place. He is indeed not worthy to set foot upon the threshold of this sanctuary, but what he could not wish for for himself must be accepted with humility, since powers of fate, out of necessity, desired to send the summons to his soul. Not I, the one I am in life, who saw himself in spirit recently as fully worthless, dare to approach this place. But Benedictus and my friend have fashioned for this man visible before you a second being, whom the first unworthy one must serve in future only as a bearer. Discipleship of spirit now has given me a self that can prove strongly able to unfold its full creative power, even while this bearer knows himself to be still far removed from highest aims of soul. If in this situation duty tells him to offer to the progress of the earth his second self awakening in him, there must, as beacon for his spirit eye, at all times stand before him the strictest rule of life, that nothing of his lower self must cause disturbance within the work his second self, not he himself, has to perform. He will work actively, withdrawn within himself, in order later to achieve the goal of his own being, which he knows to lie in the far distant future. His own anxieties he'll take with him, through life locked fast within his inmost soul, that with my ordinary human nature I am not capable of entering the temple. I had to tell you when at first you summoned me. The one who as a second self has come to him in trust perceives that destiny has laid on him the duty and the task of watching over the consequences of his work as long as he is ordered in this by the Spirit. Torquatus to Capacius. Capacius, henceforth you will perform the service of our consecrated temple, where into wisdom love should stream with warmth, as the sun's power streams warmly forth at noon. The one who wants to serve the Spirit with sacrifice, as is the way with mystic works, must be aware of dangers. Lucifer can stealthily draw near to him who serves the Spirit, and imprint upon his words the seal of the opponent of the gods. You stood before this adversary's throne and saw the consequences of his deeds. Hence, for this office, you are well prepared. Capacius When one has seen the adversary's realm, as powers of destiny have granted me to do, he knows that good and evil are but words almost incomprehensible to men. Whoever says that Lucifer is only evil might also say that fire is evil, too, because its power can do away with life. He may call water evil, since a man might easily be drowned in it. Torquatus. So Lucifer appears to you as evil through other things, but not through what he in his being signifies. Capacius. The cosmic spirit, who at earth's beginning could bring the light to human souls, must render service to the universe. That spirit's work is neither good nor bad when spirits view it who have learned to see what stern necessity reveals. Good turns to evil if an evil mind destructive in itself makes use of it. And what seems evil 
may be changed to good if some good being offers it its guidance. Torquatus, you know what your continuing need will be in standing at this place. Not by mere reasoning does love evaluate the forces that the universe reveals. It treasures them, however they spring forth, and asks how it may use what is so able to bring itself to life out of world depths. Benedictus Yet love speaks often with a gentle voice and needs support within the depths of soul. It should unite with everything that will devote itself in noble threefoldness here at this place in harmony with cosmic law. Maria will unite her work with yours. The vow she took in Lucifer's domain shall radiate for you its strength. <coughs> Maria, the words Capacius spoke were of such depth that only when they spring forth from the spirit which guides mankind in progress of the earth toward love do they reveal the truth. These words, however, will heap error upon error when they are distorted by a vicious mind and change to evil then in souls of men. For Lucifer, in truth, reveals himself as bearer of the light to eyes of soul that turn themselves toward spirit distances. But man's sole being wishes ever to arouse within its inmost depths as well what it should only gaze on and admire. It should behold the beauty that is Lucifer's, but never fall beneath his sway by letting him work actively within. He, bearer of the light, rays wisdom forth. He fills the worlds with proudest sense of self and brilliantly projects into all beings himself as model of courageous selfhood. Then may the inward life of men, rejoicing in the senses, shine out like Lucifer and filled with happy wisdom, radiate the life of self and love of self in life. But more than any other spirit, man has need of that one God who does not merely ask for admiration when he manifests himself within the glory of the outer world, but who rays forth his highest power only when he himself dwells in man's inmost being and in his love transforms death into life. A man may turn toward Lucifer and warmly feel inspired by his bright glory. He may in that way well experience himself, but he should not take Lucifer into his will. A man, however, when he rightly understands himself, will call out to that other spirit, This is the goal of love for earthly souls. Not I, but Christ lives in my life and being. Benedictus, turning to Maria. When now her soul turns to the spirit, as she has avowed before the throne of Lucifer, then through her strength the temple shall gain light to, to show the paths of earth salvation, and Christ will warmly shine forth a spirit sense of love in wisdom's hallowed place. What she can offer to the world is bound to her own course of life by one of many knots of destiny which karma forms in human lives on earth. In a long past existence she estranged the son from his own father, and now back to him again she leads the son. The soul that lives within Tomasius was in that former life by ties of blood as son bound to the soul which feels itself now in Capacius. The father will not any longer through the might of Lucifer demand the debt Maria owes, for through the power of Christ she has annulled it. Magnus Bellicosus, speaking to Hilary and Benedictus, and often turning to Felix and Felicia Balda. <clears throat> Into the sacred places shines that light which powerfully flows from spirit heights, if souls are worthy to receive it. But those high powers of wisdom, who thus reveal themselves in occult temples, have chosen also other paths to souls. The signs of our own time proclaim distinctly that all the paths should now be joined in one. The temple must unite itself with souls who've reached the spirit light in other ways, yet are, in truth, illumined inwardly. In Felix and Felicia there enter this sacred place two human beings now 
who can bring light to it in rich abundance. Felicia, I can but tell the fairy tales which form themselves to images within. I only know of their true spirit sources from what Capacius has often told me. In all humility I must believe what he has said about my gift of soul, and so I will accept what you have said as to the reason why the temple summoned me. Felix Balda I followed not alone the outward call the guardian of this temple sent to me. True to the goal of my own spirit path, I have obeyed that inner power in the direction it has always counseled me to turn my steps, so that I best fulfill what by the Spirit has been for has been preordained for me. This time I was directed clearly to just that path in spirit life which Benedictus now has shown his pupils. Before I came, a premonition showed me the signs that now I find here in the temple. For many times my soul descended into depths, and all the personal in me was cast away, and strength and patience could maintain themselves, despite the fearful loneliness that comes before I am allowed to sense the spirit light. Then all the universe seemed one with me. I found myself within that world which manifests the sources of existence. During such spirit journeys, I was often within a temple which it seems to me relates to this one here, apparent to the senses, as sounds of spoken words relate to written script. Troutman to Strader Dear Strader, at this place your task will be to speak the words which, when compared to what Tomasius has to proclaim, are as the setting sun to morning's hopeful rays. These words, within their meaning, will seize with keenness on the working of that power which showed itself to you at your probation. You had to step into the spirit realm that brings all thinking sternly to a standstill, just as your hand would have to swing the hammer into the void and your own strength could never become conscious of itself unless the blow struck down upon an anvil, so thinking could not fathom its own nature if Ahriman would not oppose himself to it. Throughout your life your thinking cast you up on rocks of opposition which have caused within your soul grave doubts and sufferings. You learned on them to know yourself in thinking, just as the light can only see itself with its own power of radiance through its reflection. The words of him who serves the temple at this place show life's reflection thus in picture form. (coughs) Strader, indeed, the light of thought for a long time shone into my existence only through reflection, but then, for seven years, The Spirit revealed itself to me in all its splendor and showed me worlds before which, earlier, my thinking stood still in torment and in doubt. Within my soul this light must grow so deep that it shall last through all eternity. Am I to find the path to spirit goals and blessing is to flow from my creative work? Theodora becoming visible as a spirit being at Strater's side. Because your strength was striving toward my light, I was allowed to gain the light for you as soon as your right time had been fulfilled. Strater, your light, my spirit messenger, shall radiate on all the words which at this place are wrung out of my soul, for Theodora's self now, too, with mine, is consecrated to the temple's holy service. Philea, Astrid, Luna, and the other philea appear in glowing cloud of light. The other philea. Thoughts are arising from altars as offerings to primal world sources. What in souls is alive, what in spirits is shining, soars up from worlds of form, and cosmic mites incline themselves in grace to human beings to kindle in powers of soul the spirit light. Philea I will entreat the cosmic spirits that their true being's light sustain the sense of soul 
and that the sounding of their words set free the spirit ear, that never be extinguished what here has been awakened on paths of soul in human lives. Ostrid, I will direct the streams of love that fill the world with warmth towards spirit realms for those who here are consecrated, so that the mood of consecration continue steadfast in human hearts. Luna, I will implore from primal powers courage and strength and let them help self-sacrifice to grow so that what is perceived as temporal can be transformed to seeds of spirit for all eternity. The curtain closes while everyone is still in the temple and that is the end of the Guardian of the Threshold by Rudolf Steiner and the end of scene 10.